Great. Uh, thank, thank you all for joining uh, the overview and screening committee. We are now um, are now starting and, and IT have started the live stream on the council on the website. So, uh, so can I welcome everyone to this meeting of the overview and screening committee? Uh, present are members of the committee, uh, co-op members and representatives of the Harrow Youth Parliament. Um, also present is, I can see the, the leader of the council and the cabinet member responsible for regeneration and therefore our item today, uh, it's Graham Henson. Uh, can I refer members and officers to the published protocols and holding virtual meetings? Uh, people should know members of the committee should ensure that they have their videos on at all time but microphones on mute unless they are speaking. Other members and participants should switch their videos off and put their microphone on mute until they're invited to speak. Case of technical problems, the meeting will be adjourned until issues are resolved. Um, the quorum for this meeting is four. Meeting is being video and audio recorded and will be available to watch on the website. And members committee, as well as advisors and officers, are reminded to use the raise hand function uh, to indicate if they want to speak. I will keep a, a monitor for that, but if I miss you um, and I'm not calling your name, uh, do unmute and say that I've missed you. Um, on that note, I'm going to move on to item one, attendance by reserve members. Are there any reserve members in attendance? Um, yes, I see. Yep, I am in James. attendance. I'm reserving. Uh, I think it's Ajay Marie, Council Ajay okay. Marie. You are, and it's your first ever committee of the first ever time you're joining the overview and screening committee. So, welcome, James. Thank you Hi, very James. much. I look forward to this three hour session. <laughs> um, and I think we have one other reserve member, Jerry. I can see Jerry. I think he looks frozen to me. Uh, Jerry, are you with us? Um, Jerry is ref, uh, reserving for uh, Jeff And. Oh, have we got Jerry? No, uh, Jerry's reserving for Jeff Anderson. Is the is the committee okay to accept that point? I think he's obviously having some technical problems at the moment. Um, yes. Okay. Item uh, two is declarations of interest. Uh, they have been published on the council website. Are there any any other declarations um, that need to be made? No, I can see Jerry's back with us again now. Jerry, um, just to confirm, you are um, reserving for Jeff on this meeting. Uh, you are muted. Right. OK, we're going to move on to now item three, which is uh, the Council's Accommodation Strategy and Harrow New Civic Centre. Now, this is a report that and an issue that we have I spent a lot of time on for, for members of the public uh, watching. The committees had two um, informal private sessions going through this um, and both have lasted more than two hours. So we've had at least four, probably close to five hours of um, informal briefings on it. So I don't feel like if uh, we're not giving it full scrutiny, there has been a lot of a lot of work done in uh, private. Um, the meeting, um, obviously, this is the only item on the agenda, so I am obviously we, we will take as uh, take all the time needed, but I am aiming to try and finish the meeting uh, within two hours, given the fact that um, we have spent about five hours um, in advance, but I, I will allow that to stretch if if needs be. Uh, can I remind members of the committee there are part two items uh, to the reports that have been received. I am. I would prefer to stay on part one for as long as possible, if all because this is a, a very important topic and I think we should do as much as we can in um, public. So if we do need to go to private session, we will, but I will be aiming to keep um, to as much in the public section as possible. Um, and Stephen, you want to come in here? Uh, yes, yeah, thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, sorry to uh, interrupt in that bit, but just on the issue of part two, um, I did note, and we got we got the papers quite quite late on Friday. But um, I I did note that there's quite a lot of stuff in part two that I, I'm not entirely sure why it's why it's there and not in part one. Like uh, quite a lot of studies and that sort of thing that that is paid for with public money. 
Um, and there may be one or two elements in there that might be confidential. But, you know, in general, a lot of the analyses, um, you know, should, to my mind, should be in the public domain. I don't really understand why they're in part two. OK, hopefully Julian's got his hand up, so hopefully he'll be able to answer that question. Uh, Chair, thank you. I, I guess that probably this is for me to apologise for based on previous experience elsewhere. Um, might I suggest for the purposes of this meeting now that uh, if members have questions uh, that are related to stuff in there that is not uh, private, we just deal with them in part one. And then if the question relates to something that should have been in private, uh, then um, we can um, uh, move to part two for that. And uh, if the committee would take my apologies for uh, perhaps I've been a little overzealous in my protection of commercial confidentiality. OK, we'll, we'll take that. Um, Thank you. We'll, we'll take that. Cathy, we'll sit on that point. Um, I don't really want to prolong this debate. Uh, you're on mute, Cathy. Yeah, Sachin, yeah, so thank you for that. So just to follow up on the same point, um, yeah, I, I note your concerns and appreciate that we are revisiting this. So one of the issues I noted that, yes, I have picked up uh, some questions on part two. And obviously my concern is that we'll be looking to looking at part one in terms of, uh, you know, reviewing and understanding, but part one's driven by the information in part two in terms of, you know, the studies and the justifications of some of the strategies in part one. So, you know, ideally part two should have come before part one. That's my understanding after reading reading the papers. And and a small point of order was I just wanted to know from officers of the legal team uh, that the reason given in the description of exempt information on the cover page of our papers reads that uh, that there is a claim to legal professional privilege to be maintained in legal proceedings. So I just wanted to understand why that reason has been given when uh, from my understanding there's not much that that's subject to legal privilege because it doesn't stand in terms of a legal proceeding that this would be considered uh, to be part of legal. All the professionals who prepare them would actually fall under that category and, uh, you know, just a bit baffled. And uh, yeah, my concern was the way it's going to flow because questions in two definitely related to one. So, I, Chair, I think, I think yes, Julian. So, so Chair, on, on that one, I think uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, having, having uh, fallen on my sword for the first one, I'm not going to fall on my sword for that one. I think that is simply a matter that the whole section of the relevant uh, clause of the uh, of the Act has been reproduced by uh, Democratic Services and um, uh, it, it's not intended to uh, to specifically relate to that. The, 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 the area was about commercial confidentiality. OK. Yeah. Stephen, uh, I, I really don't want to take yeah, too it's, much time. It's, 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 it's just just a very quick one, just just to follow up. Can we can we make sure that the papers that have been put in part two can they can they be looked at after this meeting um, and anything that can be published as part one be published after the meeting as part one? Indeed, sir. Indeed, sir. OK. Um, <clears throat> Thankfully, OK, well, there we are. That's the longest debate I've ever, ever had a, a, around this. So um, there we are. First time for everything. So we're going to move on to item item three now. Um, as I've already explained, we, uh, we, and we know what we're doing with the part two. Uh, the way we're going to run this is that uh, the administration, uh, represented by the Legal Council, uh, Graham Henson, will open. Uh, just give a bit of a, a background. I, I've asked for a maximum of five minutes. Um, and then officers between uh, Julian and Dawn um, should have around five to seven minutes um, of um, any further introdu introduction of the report. We'll then go into uh, questions. I think we'll keep it as free form as as we can. So I'll just move around people uh, allow us to move topics. But if, for instance, someone if you're going to ask a question on a topic that's already been raised and you want to follow up, uh, do let me know and we'll try and bring you in at that time. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Graeme. Oh, Jean, Jean, do you want to come in before I hand over to Graham? E no, you're on mute now. I took it off and it came back on. Um, it, I'm a little bit concerned then, and there's no no criticism of the officers who are here, that we haven't got Charlie Stewart here, because there are references here to the future of... His photo, I can see his photo. Um, ah. I can see his video, there we are. Are Char you there, Charlie? There we are, Charlie is there. Brilliant, um, thank you. Spirit and in body. Oh, even better. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, in, in, I can rest easy. Thanks, Shastrin. And in demand, Charlie. There we are. Right, Graham, 
I'm going to ring you in before we have any other questions. <laughs> yeah. I might invoke some more questions, but about the report really itself. Um, I think I'll start with a thank you to um, Keith, Councillor Keith Ferry and Councillor Adam Swirsky, who've been leading on this for some time, really. Um, both of them um, are not dealing with it anymore. And as um, Sachin pointed out, it's now come under my responsibility under regeneration. Um, but there's also a thank you to the to the staff involved. Um, so we, we have Julian and Charlie, but and Dawn, but also we have um, some others that are here as well, like Matthew Dean and um, Kirsten, have, have also been working on this. Um, and the reason I raised that is because um, when we ha we had a plan of action, as anyone knew, all the reports were going through the, through the council. All the assessments were made about moving the new civic centre into Wheelstone. All of that, um, all the financial modelling was being done, and then um, we started going out to contracts and negotiations with weights. And then COVID came along. Um, so on top of their um, response to COVID, they've also been working with a lot of um, around this contract and the work in this, these reports tonight. So when you go through it, um, I know you've all had a chance to read it. We've been through quite a few briefings around it, but I always think the history is, is quite important because pre-COVID times, which isn't that long ago, you know, people were looking at more office-based um, employment. Um, when COVID hit us, we moved more online quite rapidly. I think the um, Charlie and his IT team done exceptionally well. And I saw Raheem on the call as well um, tonight. You know, they, they, so they've moved it forward. And I think the, all, all um, responses that are coming back across the whole of the uh, sector is that people are working more remotely um, going forward and um, for admin normal administration roles are moving more remotely. And the um, we had to look at what our thinking is and take opportunities where they are. There's no point building a whacking great big new civic centre if it's not going to be used. And that was the point that was being made. So there's a number of assessments being um, undertaken um, through part of the recovery work that's been taking place across North West London, um, through the London um, economic boards that are in place. And all of them are suggesting that um, office based work is, is reduced. Also, following um, staff surveys, um, people have found you know, a better working environment in being able to work remotely away from sort of sitting um, tied to a desk, as we've always said in the past, for pro probably about half our staff um, who who actually do go out quite a part, um, bit of their work and then have to come back you know, to fill in reports previously. Now they can do a lot of that remotely and don't need to come in. So then it's looking at um, the actual space. So the reports tonight, um, I don't want to go through the whole lot of it because as Sachin said, you know, we've had quite a few hours um, talking about it, is it's looking at the opportunities that are around um, probably through this year. Um, late last year when assessments have been made. So weights have been um, is our preferred bidder. The contract's due to be signed. Um, but they've investigated a lot of it and looked at the size space we actually need. Um, from that, um, we also looked at the depot site, which is um, has two floors available and looking at what options we could do in the short term and longer term to make that a benefit to Harrow and Harrow's residents, but also to the Harrow Council staff. So you know, we could build a, a big um, six storey civic centre building. Um, actually, you could look at staying in the existing building, but we can't because it's not COVID compliant. It's um, it's number of uh, major improvements and finance would cost to make it a safe environment going forward. It's got an end of life, um, which we've known about for quite a few years. Um, so it is moving to Wheelstone was, has been projected and we finalised that. The, the projection has come back, the amount of space we actually need. We can be accommodated by using the depot site, using the two floors there. Um, we'll fit in for the um, remote working model that people have been talking about and also build a civic centre site. We've also a com um, space for I think is about 100 people, I think, in there, um, which uh, desk space, but it doesn't mean people are tied to the desk and it'll be rotation of work. It's also a civic space there, a library space, and also um, we're in front of office as we'd like to call it in a reception sort of place. The opportunity um, is looking at the car parking was with eight spaces provided in, the in that plan by paying out some um, by 
you building a smaller civic centre, we could actually put in um, 40 car parking spaces, which is um, the maximum achievable, which has always been said on that site um, for underground work, um, but also brings in um, much needed affordable housing. Um, the reason this is set out differently in this report is in the future we could look at where that affordable housing is across the number of sites for that financial model that hasn't been done, but it gives us the capacity to do so with our land value available. The <clears throat> Just fitting out the depot itself, I don't know if people have been down there, but we have got multi-storey car parking going in. It's um, it's in a very advanced state, it's nearly finished and the pictures look really good. You've seen some of the designs that are, are in there already um, and they brought the good, really good people in to actually um, to lead on that and set it out about how we need to work going forward. And that's based around some of the really big businesses that are around the country that sort of feed into these sort of debates. So it gives us um, five, five stories, isn't it? Five, five floors of a range of work settings available so we can move around. The only sort of place that would be controlled would be the CCTV area. The rest of it can be adapted as needed. There's, um, what is it, 38,000 square foot of, um, square metres of usable office floor space, which is still quite significant. Um, it's got all the welfare facilities and the cafe on site and it's also a close proximity to um, Wildstone Town Centre and the High Street and also the bus routes. It's got planning permission for public sector use and that was looking even if we want to move into more shared services so it's all it's, everything is okay there and also the um, high speed data cables are coming through as part of the um, package we agreed for a grant situation. So I think in, in a way, I think it's, it's, it's exceptionally positive about the option about using this, that site is because we do have a, a quite significant shortage of affordable property across Harrow itself. And the um, borough plan is setting out that we have to build 800 a year over the next 10 years. That's in the draft borough plan. But we know from the government's um, analysis that, that could be two and a half thousand a year in later stages of the plan. And so you know, we can advance, all we can do, it gives us an opportunity by moving into the depot site, is actually start construction work um, a lot earlier on the existing um, civic centre site, could actually start in the end of 2022. Otherwise, we'd have to wait until the new civic centre is built and then you start looking at um, what you do with the existing um, sites. I won't go into the financial details because I think we've gone through that quite a bit already. Um, Dawn, I know Dawn's here and she, she she knows the figures and she'll tell me off if I get them wrong, but that's, that's quite right really. Um, you know, th th this has been a lot of analysis, not um, by Dawn, but also Addison Young and also Pinson and Masons, who've um, analysed a lot of the data that's coming through to make sure that we're not overexposed. And I'd like to finish on what we started with in um, beginning of 2018 when we set out the direction for the Regen programme was to make sure that there's no drain on the current um, council's revenue funds um, accounts because we knew the pressures that were coming down the line. We didn't want to put ourselves at risk. And I think, you know, if we were to build something too big and not use it, that would put a significant drain, ongoing drain onto our um, resources. Um, if anything was, um, it gives us more affordable housing, which also addresses that um, concern that we have there. But it also allows the staff to work in a more modern environment um, and working more flexibly the way they've worked throughout the pandemic and the way they wish to carry on going forward. So I'd leave it there for the moment, um, Sachin, and then if there's any questions come up later on, I can address them then. Great, thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, if I'll, I'll bring in uh, I, the next bit is between Julian and Dawn, so I'm assuming between the two of you you've worked out wh which way you're going to do it. So if you want to, between the two of you, introduce the report and then we'll move into questions from the committee. Thank you, Chair. So you get me next and then Dawn will talk you through the numbers. So I'm not going to talk about numbers at all, uh, or not not at this stage anyway. Um, so I think um, the, the thing most productive I can do, Chair, is just take you through uh, the headlines of the report and what is there. Uh, members will recall that this is the second of three reports uh, in terms of finalising the establishment of the Harris Strategic Development Partnership. Uh, the first was appointing Waiters Preferred Bidder in September 
This is the one for the accommodation strategy. And the key part of this particular report is that by agreeing uh, the accommodation strategy in the HNC in particular, you will inform the final business plan, uh, which can go into the final report on the 1st of July for setting up and establishing the partnership. So the report talks you through the history, the decision to set up the partnership and to put it into it the core sites, uh, including the provision of a new civic centre. Uh, this was based on a strategic brief. Uh, that all then went out to procurement. Uh, and as I said a moment ago, that procurement process got you to a preferred bidder in September last. Uh, the report then goes on to talk about the change of the situation in the world. Uh, the deepening of the learning from flexible futures and from what can be done elsewhere. And of course, the experience of the recent pandemic, uh, which has changed the, the council's requirements and uh, the uh, recognition, I think, that um, accommodation can be dealt with in a more agile and more efficient manner than perhaps even the original strategic brief. Of course, the uh, forward drive depot is now available, uh, which will be high quality offices uh, in operation and um, uh, offices that uh, uh, the report draws your attention to some of the constraints, uh, but nonetheless uh, good size effective accommodation, uh, which um, will be a, a considerable improvement on the existing approach. The report also sets out the approach to identifying ancillary spaces. There are some things that are not suitable or not necessary for forward drive. And uh, Charlie, as you say, is here to answer further questions on that. Um, and then the report goes on to talk about the fit out for the depot, the tenants fit out or the category B fit out. Um, every building is, is built essentially, first of all, to a commercial building, I should say, uh, is built to a category A standard, first of all, which is essentially the shell and core, and then it's fitted out to the requirements of the occupier. So in this instance, this is the council's category B fit out and the report tells you uh, what is proposed and what you get uh, uh, as a result of that work. Uh, it seeks your approval to give the work to your on-site uh, contracted Kia, uh, and uh, this will be within the uh, governing procurement rules, the uh, uh, public sector, the public contracts requirements, um, uh, but also seeks a uh, uh, a waiver to um, increase the percentage that can be awarded within the council's own contract rules and procedures. And it brings you up to date on the current contractual position uh, with Kia. It then moves on to talk you through the new proposal for the HNC uh, and the fact that as a result, as the leader says, of not needing uh, as much accommodation for staff as previously, partly informed by the learning that I referred to earlier, um, the proposal is for a 20,000 square foot office space, uh, which essentially contains public uh, areas the same as in the original version, uh, but significantly uh, reduces the actual accommodation space, uh, but retains uh, the basement car parking uh, proposed by Waits in their bid. And as the leader says, it also gives the opportunity um, to, to provide additional affordable housing uh, uh, subject to uh, some more detailed uh, uh, work on the, uh, the due diligence of the HRA. Um, there is some commentary on the economic benefits and a reprisal of the advice from uh, both Savills and Avison Young, again, which the uh, leader referred to. Um, there is uh, a detailed equalities impact assessment that has been blessed by the Council's uh, equalities officer um, and uh, a comprehensive risk register which has similarly been approved and uh, mindful of uh, debate elsewhere I have indeed included uh, rather than leave it for the HSDP's own risk I have included uh, a risk concerning planning risk and what happens if the uh, if planning permission was not granted. Uh, bringing you bang up to date then the final section of the report uh, is the next steps and essentially, as I said at the outset, that is to include uh, in the final business plan for the HSTP uh, with contract close on uh, July the 1st and then uh, a mobilisation period over the summer, summer before design and planning uh, uh, take, take place in earnest. Uh, obviously, I'm here to take questions, uh, Chair, but I'll hand over to Dawn at this point. Right, Dawn. 
Thank you, Chair and Julian. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go over um, the financial implications of, of the report of what Julian's talked about. We have got the financial implications split into two clear sections to make it very transparent. Um, the first section concerns the um, the first section concerns the accommodation strategy about us fitting out the depot for the use by staff. Um, it very clearly states that the cost of this to the council is roughly is, is seven point six million pounds in terms of capital, but this is capital that is already provided for within the um, within the council's capital program, so it's not a requirement to put any further capital fund capital funding or financing into the budget. And there is a, an associated revenue cost of 725,000, which is primarily for ancillary spaces, which has been accommodated as part of the outturn report for 2021, which comes to Cabinet next month. So in terms of the accommodation strategy side of, of this report, the money is in the capital programme and the revenue development we have accounted for. And this report just talks about various um, environments that are needed to, to just move a little bit to that capital funding around to meet our financial um, regulations. In terms of the larger side of the report, this is concerned with the financial implications for the Council um, of the HSDP. As the leader has already um, talked about, this, this is about ensuring that the implications of the HSDP are cost neutral on, on the Council, i.e. that there is no impact on the, on the Council's uh, general, general account, the revenue fund, fund for this scheme. I'll only go through the high level numbers because they're detailed in the report, but what the report shows is that the Council's total capital investment over the initial 12 year period of the scheme is £48.6 million and that covers that covers the Council's investment in the HSDP, the money for the new Harrow Civic Centre and the parking, um, and new Civic Centre and the parking. Um, now, what that shows, but what that shows as well, it's very clear that the council gets returns from the, the strategic development partnership. That's our purpose for going into a partnership, which actually covers a significant amount of those capital investments and actually leaves the council with a net borrowing requirement of just over £10 million. Pounds. What is what we are appreciative in this report is that there is a that a lot of these cash flows are profiled for certain times. And, and obviously that is going to be a big part of the management of this of this um of this arrangement and that's reflected in the risk register but it but it is important to remember that the council has a net requirement of 10.2 million pounds um in terms of capital investment um in terms of in terms of the revenue implications what we are doing at this stage is the council not only does it get a significant uh, return on its on the capital that it's putting in but it also gets um a series of interest payments from the hsdp throughout the throughout the term of the arrangement and it is these that we will use to fund the capital investment to prevent any impact on the general fund. So we will not build anything into the council's budget. In addition to that, we also get a significant chunk of, um, of dividends from the arrangement, um, particularly later on in the project to see remainder of the properties have sold. And this obviously gives the council um, some scope in terms of how it would like to use those dividends. Being very prudent, I've said in the report at the moment that the, the call on those dividends will be to make sure that we clear any debt associated with this arrangement to prevent any legacy debt. But that does give the council some opportunities later on, later on um, in later on within this partnership. And that's all I really wanted to say, Chair. Uh, thank you, Dawn. Um, so I should have said at the start to um, also uh, welcome. We've got representatives from Waits as well who may be able to answer any questions the committee has. Um, Julian, do you want to come back in before I? Open I up? did very, very briefly, uh, Chair, if I may. I was just going to draw your attention uh, to the uh, recommendations uh, in the report um, and uh, just say that um, uh, I didn't propose to, uh, to to read through them in uh, in any detail, but they are set set out at the front of the report, as you'd imagine, and those are what Cabinet will be asked to bless uh, on the 27th of May. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, the first first question is from Stephen. Um, yep. Th thank you very much, Chairman. Um, thank you to all for your uh, presentations. Um, and uh, they were all. Uh, thank you for coming today as well. And and uh, look forward to look forward to to a good discussion. Um, just want just on a first of all in on on a on on a basic level, we've got. An accommodation strategy in front of us that we're being asked to consider, and and you know ultimately for cabinet to to rec uh, to to consider approving. Um, 
And to, to my mind, an accommodation strategy on a basic level should tell you exactly where all our staff are going to be and where all our services are going to be delivered from. Now, we have um, a, a number of outstanding services where we we don't know yet where they're going to be delivered from. Um, these are the so-called ancillary spaces and they're called ancillary. I don't know why they're called ancillary, but these are some of the most important services the council does. We've got registrar, social care, homelessness, um, you know, the, the front of house access Harrow services. And, and I know that, um, that that Charlie and his team have been working away a bit very hard and no, no, uh, um, no, no, no disputes about, you know, the excellent work that they're doing, trying to sort this out. But what I what I don't understand is why was it left so late to 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 try and sort slot in where these um, where where these services are going to be? Shouldn't if they, they seem to be like an afterthought, shouldn't we know right at the beginning? You know, shouldn't we know by now if if you're trying to approve an accommodation strategy? Um, where all these services are going to be. Um, and, and as we've seen on page 11 of the supplemental agenda, we don't have certainty about any, where any of these services are going to be delivered from. Who's going to take that one? I think that's one for Charlie in the first instance, Chair. Right. Chair, did you want me to leave my uh, camera and mobile on if, if you'd like me to direct the answers? Um, yeah, it might, might make sense if you, if you, Julian, if you, yeah. Trivia the questions out between the officers, but we'll yeah. bring Charlie in. Chair, uh, Julian, I'm sure can help uh, Graham direct officers to, to the answers, but really it should be the leader who is directing us to provide the information that the cabinet want. And of course, we'll provide the facts of the matter, not the opinion on it, of course. Um, and Graham has his hand up, so I will, <laughs> if unless you want me, otherwise, Chair, perhaps he should speak first on the matter. Well, OK, we'll, we'll go to Graham. Thank you. It's, a, it's an interesting question, but I thought I'd, I'd preempt it in the um, introduction remarks. Um, they have been exceptionally busy over the last few months um, since January. We've had the highest death rate of um, the pandemic was over the first few weeks of January. And so some things have been paused a bit. But in reality, it's not been forgotten. Adult social care works from a number of locations already, and may predominantly working remotely from home. And under the new structure, they'll be going into um, have collaborative space around the borough, and that's what we're looking at the art centre and um, the depot site. The one, the people that run the registrars, that was looking at the, um, the museum sites as a logical site to start with. But that hasn't been finalised and Charlie's looking at work that forward. But don't forget, this isn't going to take place until um, quite a few months time yet. And the access to the council is something that's always been the back of our minds. So we've got people with homelessness has already been um, coming through. Um, they don't actually go through the Civic Centre. I don't know if you've been in the Civic Centre recently, but it's been closed for a few months now. Um, and so we're looking at other ways of accessing through. Um, that could be through um, referrals through agencies, which is a normal one to come through. The housing team um, can be contacted for the out of hours. But we're also looking about how we can extend on their libraries like other boroughs have done to meet people at those locations in a sort of a room there rather than having to traipse all the way across the Harrow. One of the biggest, um, the, you get an introductory um, presentation as councillors from Jonathan Milburn to show you how the context with the council has changed over the years. And very few people do actually come through to the Civic Centre site anymore. But their biggest gripe is actually having to get to the Civic Centre. So I think we're looking forward. We need to understand where we can run some of these services from to be in a, um, a more sometimes more accessible than the Civic Centre. But Charlie's probably got more up to date around um, where the registrars are going. In the temporary and short term view before they move to the new Civic Centre being built on Peel Road Car Park. Thank you, Leader. Uh, Chair, if I may. Yes. Um, so I think essentially the question has two points to it. First of all, why didn't we not do the work to begin with? And second, essentially, does it make any difference to the actual report as it stands? And sorry, is that any echoing back? Um, I can't hear an echo. Uh, it may just be my, my own echo. There is an echo. 
I can hear an echo. There is an echo, yeah. Is there still an echo now? Is that cleared it? No, OK, fine. Thank you very much. <coughs> got the thumbs up now. So, so the reason the first one on why not at the beginning, there was a piece of work, um, an overview taken out by officers right at the beginning, which indicated that A, it was possible to move um, what we're calling ancillary services at the moment, but the council is quite right, these are very important services. So there was work done to say that they can move and there were places that would be available to them, so it was possible to do so. Uh, with that in mind, therefore, the report could be written. Um, the second point is, why was that work not followed up? Well, for as indicated in the report and as the leader mentioned, officers have been extremely busy on uh, C19. And thank you, Stephen, for your remarks on the fact that we're still working very hard because we are at this moment. And there literally was no space to put in the follow up, but sufficient was felt that was done to allow the report to go forward. Um, something else has come up in the meantime because of C19, which is the fact that uh, patterns are changing and so potentially is our response to those patterns as well. So if uh, we had actually just put in that that we potentially saw as being the answer right at the beginning, we may well be out of line with actual residence requirements going forward and certainly how the services would wish to align themselves to deliver those requirements as well. Um, therefore, we have picked it back up now and uh, perhaps uh, Julian might be able to say more about why this is not too late for the report to go forward because there are other reasons why the report needs to go forward. Um, as far as where is concerned, try to outline in the report where we are at this moment in time. Uh, Headstone Manor is still um, the viable place for the registrars and it does make sense to put the two together, um, both for residents um, and for the service, but especially for residents. Um, Paul, um, the Corporate Director of People is, and his team, have been looking at uh, where all planned activity that was currently taken care of in the civil centre could happen and actually are quite um, enamoured of the fact of bringing that into the people's estate to align it alongside the professionals who are supporting these people, which seems to be uh, better, but um, potentially we could get him here and answer that for the residents as well. Um, that does leave a couple of things where we are not exactly sure where they'd be uh, moving to. One of the most important is the emergency service of both homelessness and also children's services. Now, there are very few interactions on that. Uh, so few we don't can't even record them the less than one a week, but they do occur. And therefore, we're looking to bring those together. And there's another change to the services way of working that is coming forward because of the pandemic. It is believed that it would be much better for residents if we can bring those two emergency services together, which we couldn't before, and look for a good appropriate point in the uh, place, if in the borough, to actually house those which we are doing at the moment. We don't have an answer to that, but we are looking, looking for that at this moment in time. And those are the main strands for the ancillary services. There are two other general strands, which is to do with storage, uh, for things which is uh, the answer to which is going paperless, not paper totally got rid of, but paperless, which will answer our storage and also hybrid mail and other such moves. And the final one is cashless because we have a, a collection of cash at the front cashier's office and also uh, within the building we have a bullion room that handles the cash and going to cashless or cash light will um, change that and ease that situation and that is perfectly possible and we've already got plans afoot for that. The final thing I should mention is that on the general inquiries piece um, to, to the front desk, we are looking to pilot that in July in a library and then roll it out potentially from there, if Cabinet agree, to the rollout to a new model for delivery of that. That, like a lot of councils are doing at this moment in time, puts information provision to residents in libraries and local places, which is actually very good for residents and is a model I have used elsewhere before and does, does aid those. So that's about where we are on the ancillary places. A chair, I think Julian might want to come in 
on the how this relates to the report and the need to move forward on the report. Yes, Julian. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I mean, the uh, as, as Charlie says, the uh, it's certainly not by any means too late because, as we said, the the whole process of this is that this informs uh, the business plan. In actual fact, the ancillary spaces for which provision is made in the financial implications uh, and also a, 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 a mitigation scenario should the uh, uh, the need prove greater than the 500,000 uh, are provided for, but they are of course a council cost. Um, but uh, perhaps the overriding factor is that of course um, there's no, no uh, plans are currently to hand uh, the new civic, the old civic centre, I should say, uh, over to the partnership until October of next year. So there is still time to work through and find the optimum and correct scenario. Um, I think uh, just by way of sort of additional uh, background, um, where this happens elsewhere, it is not unusual uh, for some services to be provided elsewhere, uh, at least in the initial years and during the transition period. And um, uh, finding the right solution uh, is probably better than uh, uh, being too prescriptive too early. Thank you. Start, uh, yeah, so thank you. I mean, just just to come back on the really, my, firstly, my, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we're not talking about what happens over the so much over the transition, but it look, but but these are this is where there seems to be a permanent plan to spread these services across the borough and, and not put them in the in in, in the new civic. Um, I, I, I think if I'm correct, that that seems to be the understanding. But I mean, my my concern is that and, and I, I, I take your point, Julian, that you don't necessarily, um, you know, you, you, you're, you're suggesting you don't need to have all the, the T's crossed and I's dotted at this point. But these these seem to be it, it seems quite fundamental that you, you need to at least know have an idea of where all these services are going to be because it's about um it's 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 about you know thinking it through and it's it's also about you know it's it's where you're starting from if you're starting from the point of these are our needs and we're going to design a strategy around them and make sure they're all designed in at the design stage that they're going to be in the in in these places then you know that if that was the approach we would we would know where all of these things are going to be but because we've kind of we've proceeded through the strategy and then for various reasons um, we, 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 we got a later later point of, uh, of, 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 of looking at where these things are going to be. It's like we've we it's like we're doing it the other way around. We've, we started with a strategy and we're trying to bend our needs around it um, and, and it just feels quite sort of uh, dis, dissatisfactory really. So I think I ought to defer to Charlie on because uh, uh, I think my my understanding is that we do know uh, roughly where these things will be and uh, uh, and plans are in foot and what the report describes is a process to get there. Um, but um, I think um, the, um, the the way I would characterise it would be more in terms of uh, uh, this is the journey, this is finding the right solutions and um, uh, this is the um, uh, the overarching uh, way of doing it. I think it's fair to say also uh, that, of course, some of these strategies, you know, digital provision of service, for example, have uh, been uh, in the council's purview for some considerable time. But uh, Charlie, yes, councillor's quite right. You wouldn't start out without an idea of where they're going to, but we do have that idea, as I try to outline there. Okay. Um, I've got, in terms of council, I've got Jean and then Sarah. So I'm going to take uh, Jean. Uh, can I remind people uh, the shorter the questions and short answers will help us get through uh, the meeting uh, with as many questions asked as possible? Jean. You can if you like, but I'm going to ask my question anyway. Um, I'm adding something to this, Charlie. Future proofing in reverse. How does that sound? You know, it, it, it's a bit like backfitting something, you know, when when you've gone too far to be able to backfit it because you don't know what you're backfitting and then suddenly you're left with a, a, a bit of a problem with ancillary services. And a good example of this is that I had a formal meeting or visit to every bit of the Green Hill Library today. The Green Hill Library is amazing. And how many other libraries have we got? 
five. Yeah, do we all agree we've got five libraries? You can just not. And the point is, if you look at the library spaces, Greenhill's got the best library space, but it is uh, wonderful because it's open plan. You don't have loads of rooms there, Charlie, or anyone, Graham, to really have a regular arrangement to see uh, young young children who are in stress or whatever, all the ancillary things you're referencing. You don't have that. Um, and the same, the other libraries in the in they've been done up, but they don't have that level of room. So to try and rely on a full, a, a really a false, a false assumption that we've got space in libraries, I don't believe that will fulfil it. Um, and the other question, um, this is for uh, the leader. Lee, you mentioned just in passing, and then of course there's the Harrow Arts Centre. What do you have in mind for that? Great. Well, we've got great things at Harrow Arts Centre. We've been building it up over the years. We've got grants in place. And you know what I mean. I like you said that, show. and then you know exactly what I mean. You know, you referenced it in terms of the accommodation strategy. So, you know, what is there at the Arts Centre that's going to help the accommodation strategy? Seriously, it's a serious question. I love the Arts Centre and where it's developing. I'm not criticising that at all. I'm just saying in reference to the accommodation strategy, how do minimum number of libraries and space and the Arts Centre really help the accommodation strategy? Well, there's two things. On the Harrow Arts Centre, there is a lot, a lot of unused space in the Arts Centre. All the rooms are upstairs and people do use them. They did look at renting some out prior to COVID and there's no reason why the council couldn't use some of those when you need to. But it's looking at a number range of options that could be done so people haven't got to travel right across the borough. And if you go into places like Kenton Library and Stanmore, there is a lot of space there. Mm. Uh, Willstone Library is quite a big room available in Willstone Library and South Harrow. Well, it's a bit small, so maybe we should um, do something with that to make it a lot better. And mm. don't forget, we um, if you go back in back in 2012, we did actually use the libraries for um, as a route through to access Harrow. So mm -hmm. we had the terminals in place where people could take documents, they had support of applying for benefits or housing benefit in particular, but also sure. through for um, council tax inquiries and or online payments that they wanted to make could be done from a library. So all these options are available and there's also um, you know, the computer systems are being upgraded in libraries as well since we got them back. Some of that work has paused because of COVID, because the buildings have had to be closed because um, they weren't really mm -hmm. compliant. But I think in a way that, you know, I was saying we were asking about options. We're not saying everyone has to go there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you look at the numbers of actually coming into the council building. I think we're just outside. If you take away um, some of the general inquiries that come through, you probably only get about 50 people a month coming through into the Civic Centre at this moment mm -hmm. in time. So the, end, the ones that we're concerned about would be the children's um, mm. access points, which is on the ground floor at the moment, um, which goes into the yacht. So that would be in a secure location, as Charlie's talking about. Mm. Um, when Stephen was talking about longer term, we, we expect that to be sort of going in through the new Civic Centre site in Wildstone. Okay. But there's Thank also you. you've got places like the Grange as well, which can be used if necessary. And there's other places that we can. It's just looking at it in a completely different way, because as I said right at the beginning, if all every organisation around the country, every large organisation which runs sort of um, these sort of business um, transactions is looking at um, less more people working remotely than travelling in every day and sitting at a desk. Yeah, I think uh, just to come back on that. I quite understand. I mean, I've, I used to lecture on working flexibly and et cetera, et cetera, uh, a long time back, and I don't disapprove of any of that as long as we've got everything in place to support that. And I know Charlie is working on that, but nevertheless, there are some issues around that. But also, you know, if we get people wanting to have uh, visits, private visits, um, to meeting up with the children's uh, officer or something like that, they all would have to go to Wheelstone. Is that what you're saying eventually, rather than in a library or something like that. I just can't understand whether we're fixed on this or we're actually transitioning through to the actual new Civic in Wheelstone. I think Charlie, Charlie might be able to help us on that very specific. Thank you. There's an officer point, I think. Uh, just, just, yes, Councillor, just to tidy up on libraries. Uh, the libraries are not for the children's services interactions mm. at all. Good. It may be that someone comes in and 
in an emergency and asked, but they will be directed elsewhere, as I might do in the library at the moment. They are mainly for those bits that are to do with housing benefit and council tax issues and mm. general inquiries. Um, we were at a max before pandemic getting seven a day. Mm -hmm. That type coming in. Now that went, as uh, the leaders said, that's gone down to virtually nothing at the moment. It may go back up again, but I doubt it because we brought in other digitalization. So the sure. libraries are just for that. And we only have one outlet at the moment, of course, the Civic and uh, Main Library and Hill Library will be that. What we will do in the other libraries, you know, the four libraries as you're talking about, mm. is provide access through that, even if that's just one person standing there with a tablet in hand to help people that come through the door. Mm -hmm. In all of the places we do have, uh, I'm trying to think if it's all, no, may, um, may, may not be every single one, but we do have access to meeting room in the back where we can take people in for a quiet conversation if necessary. That happens so rarely it's not true. Mm. The children's mm. bit is through the children's uh, and the adults as well, um, estate. And the corporate director for Peoples is more than happy and his team are that that can be done. Not only can be done, will improve the residents experience of it. Mm -hmm. I say again, the bit that we haven't got is the emergency bit, mm -hmm. homelessness, family in distress, children's bit, which we will look to bring together somewhere for the benefit of residents and somewhere that uh, makes sense for residents across the board. Mm -hmm. And that takes care of the vast majority um, the only other bit is the cash kiosk, which I mentioned, we are looking sure. to go cashless much more than we did before. And that's everybody that comes to the Civic at this moment in time, apart from normal visitors. Uh, sorry, two officers, that is. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, uh, no, thank you for that. If we can keep an eye then, because it, it really helps us to know that the future proofing is going in the right direction and that we will be able to do that sort of thing in the way that uh, residents appreciate. But thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Chairman. Great. Um, thanks. I, I just had two questions really around council employees and then the safeguarding of sensitive data. Um, I know that in December 2020, the Pulse survey showed that staff were very positive about flexible working, but what plans do we have in place to take the temperature of how staff feel about the flexible working and their needs once it's up and running? And what measures are we putting in place to be like reflexive to um, council employees' needs once once that's up and going. Okay, Charlie, do you want to start and then we'll bring Julian in, I think. Uh, and if I may, uh, Chair, uh, Raheem's on the line and he can actually talk yeah. very much yeah. Turkey on, on exact details. So um, that was one survey we do. We've also had um, a groups meeting to discuss various aspects, welfare, et cetera, et cetera, disabilities. So a whole gambit of focus groups collecting information on how we move forward on that. Um, there's just about to be mass communication and engagement going out. In fact, Raheem and I, um, Raheem's been um, doing his nut this week with the amount of things he's got to do in the following week on presentation to leadership groups, etc. We've also just started up what's called a Change Champions Network, which is people from all parts of the organisation at all different levels who come together and discuss various matters, one of them being flexible futures, which allows us to not only provide more information to people, but also gather the thoughts from from uh, people across the organisation and move that forward into them. Raheem, do you want to grab this and other information that we're in exchange uh, engagement we're doing? Please do sure, this. as you say, there's um, multiple channels that we're engaging on. I think the main the main one for staff in the in the short term is that we are um, refreshing the home working risk assessments, which will inform us of those those staff who have mental well-being issues, those staff who have uh, physical um, disabilities, um, and identify um, their current needs, so that we can both support them to continue to work at home, given that's going to be um, part of going forward, but also make sure that we support them um, as they come back into the office. Um, and one of the discussions that I'm facilitating uh, in the organisation is how we um, modify that process, because whereas whereas you would previously had to have your workstation set up for your needs, now we have to consider that people will be working at mul multiple workstations. Um, so we're working through how we can support people in that in a flexible way. Um, as Charlie said, we're engaged with um, all the relevant groups, Dawn, Madge, 
et cetera, et cetera. They're involved. So I, I guess we're, we're trying to meet it at several levels. We're trying to make um, the building as accessible and the furniture as um, uh, as as high a grade as possible to minimise issues for individuals. And then within that, we're trying to work out, OK, that doesn't that doesn't address everybody. Let, let's look at what we can do to address those those with special needs. Um, and as Charlie said, we've got um, leadership forum engagement, change champion forum. We'll be working with each and every team for them to figure out um, how it's going to work for them, how they can make use of the new space, new technology, everything else that the council's um, <coughs> excuse me, everything else that the council's put in place or is putting in place. Um, so yeah, it'll be a multi multi level um, change engagement over the next um, nine or ten months. I should also say, Chair, that we're just about to open up the Civic Centre as a Civic Hub, <clears throat> and it will be a mirror although not exact, of course, of forward drive. But we are using that not only to help people get out of their houses if they need to and start to see people face to face in a secure way, but also to pilot a lot of the ways that we're working in forward drive so that we can learn from people as they are actually doing it. Great. And Graham, you want to come in on this? Yes, Sarah's raised an important um, question I've been sort of puzzling over for some time. And I think it started where we went straight into COVID and people started working remotely. And it's a different way of managing people in a sense as well. So since Tracy's been in, part of her remit is rebuilding up the training and development sites to ensure that um, not that people have got all the tools that they need to manage it properly, but also how to manage staff when you're working um, remotely or you haven't got that line of sight every seven, five days a week. You know, the sort of how you manage that flexible approach to working and the outcomes based sort of um, work level loads that people end up with. But Tracy's working all of that and it should be coming through soon. Thanks, thank you. Can I just ask one more yeah, quick question absolutely. about um, so it's about really safeguarding of um, sensitive information. I just wanted to ask, given that um, we're moving to work in kind of remotely and more flexibly, uh, flexibly, kind of what safeguards are being put in place for the management of sensitive material um, where people maybe might be working at home? Um, mm. uh, and I know we're talking about paper less, but, you know, things like shredding facilities or, um, you know, I'm just thinking about kind of confidentiality and how we're going to maintain that if 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 staff are working in different locations. Raheem might, I imagine, might be the best person on this point. Yeah, I'm, there's a number of topics coming up around confidentiality, both in terms of working um, at home, but also in terms of working in the office in a much more mixed environment where your colleagues are not necessarily trained in the same field as you are. Um, we don't have the answers yet, but that is one of the focus groups that we're going to be working through with staff on in terms of coming up um, with the solutions around how that would work. Obviously, paper paperless helps, um, but as we know, that paper is probably the most most common um, cause of a um, a data breach. So definitely something that we need to um, consider how we address that going forward. Mm. Thank you. So, so okay, Sarah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. OK, um, I know, Stephen, you've had your head up first, but I would do want to go to people that haven't asked first. So I'm going to I'm going to go Canty, Dan and then back to Stephen. Canty. Hi, thank you, Stephen. Um, I, I just wanted to quickly pick up on uh, something Graham said and uh, Graham, um, I know sort of, you know, this kind of reflects what would have been approved in May 2019 generally in terms of the regeneration strategy. And I think it was mentioned at that time in the cabinet papers as well that, you know, one of the objectives of regeneration was about, uh, you know, improving the uh, our residents sort of health, welfare and well-being. So um, would you know, because I, I'm not sure from these papers we have today, sort of, you know, how that's being achieved in terms of the current strategy. And also, sort of, you know, my my concern, which I think we've raised before, that uh, uh, there's been no input from residents to, or you know, to say, oh, by the way, we're planning this, and you know, how does it feel? What do you think about it, sort of thing? So, uh, I just thought it would have been important, leader. So, if you can just have some reflection on that, please. Thank you, Graham. 
Well, it has had wide publicity for a number of years um, through this, and it was through the Build, and Build a Better Harrow programme that started it all off, which came in in 2014. So there has been a lot of um, engagement and publicity around it all. How the council operates, I think, is um, was for the council to work out what it can really do. Um, and how uh, the base, what they have to make sure is that it's got accessibility from residents, which it's also doing. Um, sorry, Graham, you didn't mention anything about the health because obviously one of the things we're looking at is the revised sort of HA, you know, the accommodation strategy. So that means that, you know, the council spread out, like we just mentioned today, in various uh, places, not in one building. That's key. Uh, and also, some in terms of, you know, our policies and strategies being linked to sort of our objectives from day one. So I'm just trying to connect it to, I don't see anything. So I was hoping to get some information on that, please. Well, we're not, if you look at the current state of um, how the council operates, we're not in one building at the moment. We're actually moving more into one building um, by moving to the, um, the depot sites because you, you, our frontline services down the depot are sort of uh, are remote. The people in the, in the, um, in the civic centre as well aren't that accessible for residents because you can't just walk in and say you want to be seen. So it's a location, it's a building, isn't it? So we're looking at where we put it. We've also got, um, we've actually reduced the number of sites down from when it was back in 2010 into, because um, we used to have above the library in West Harrow for a part of the time. We had the planning team outside in Gayton Road. So over the years, a lot of it's come into a central place, but the key part of it, most of the people who do go out to speak to residents, go out to speak them, speak to them, very few come into the civic centre. So working from a single site at the depot is, is probably an improvement for many. OK, I'm going to bring Julian in. Thank you, Chair. Uh, very briefly, because it is uh, referred to in the report and it's also in um, the uh, Volterra report, but the Volterra report makes a number of commentary points around uh, not merely the, uh, uh, the air quality benefits around the parking, but also around the health, well-being and the affordable housing benefits. So there are a number of uh, relevant benefits that are pointed to both in the report and in the Volterra document. Um, the, um, the other reports, uh, Savills of course comment on the benefits of affordable housing, although as I said earlier they do ask for some further work on the finances. Um, and um, uh, in, in pure economic terms, uh, you'll notice that the uh, current proposal is recommended by Volterra as uh, overall a positive benefit. Is that okay, Kanti? Uh, yeah, as you mentioned uh, the reports, Julian, uh, I'm just sort of um, trying to understand how much input have this report had on our decision making and in terms of you know what were you exactly kind of looking to because i will come back to both these reports and uh, i will raise my questions and queries then but i just wanted to understand how much of an impact did well at least two of the reports the avison young and the Walter one have on the decision that's in part one because uh, as i mentioned at the beginning that i, I just thought you know it would be better to consider most most aspects of part two into part one so um, just just on the on the I, I once again make the apology that I was, as I said, overzealous on the thing. I don't intend to keep repeating it, but uh, I. Uh, no worries. Yeah. Under no, no, we'll move on from there. Don't worry. Yeah, sure. Right. So um, on the um, uh, having having done that and I happy, as we said, uh, uh, I didn't get any criticism from the lawyers when I said earlier that we'd talk about those bits that were not uh, particularly private or confidential. Um, uh, I think in terms of the uh, weight of the decision making, uh, as I am not the decision maker, uh, I ought to um, uh, address that uh, question elsewhere. Uh, but in terms of the point of the reports, the point of the reports is to provide evidence and to provide uh, support where appropriate for the decisions. And um, for example, uh, if the um, uh, Avis and Young report that referred to the letability of the centre of Wealdstone uh, still said in uh, uh, early 2021 what it had said pre-COVID, uh, you might no doubt have been in a different position. Similarly, 
uh, I suspect that uh, if you've been in, we would have certainly have uh, been producing different uh, information if Volterra had said that the solution is economically uh, damaging. Uh, I mean, that's the point of providing providing evidence from the uh, reports. Um, in terms of the weight of the decision, I mean, I am your advisor and uh, I'll let others comment on that. And just I'll bring Graham in on because the question has been on on how it's impacted decisions. So if we can go on that one in terms of the administration. Well, how COVID has impacted decisions. The, the report, I think the question is around the reports and how you've used that as part of your decision making. Well, we've used all the, as I said at the beginning, we've used a lot of technical advice it's from Julian, Charlie, Paul Walker is now left, Dawn. Um, and the, but also we've been fully supported by Avonston Young and Pinsent Masons around the um, legal process. They dealt with the legal process. Sorry, Avonston Young gives the uh, some of the technical advice, along with Savills to give us the financial advice, and all of that leads into um, recommendations that have come forward tonight. But also, um, Waits have been really um, good about it you know, since they've been the preferred bidder, and they've been working on a lot of the with the team to try and sort of move some of this in some direction and give their advice on this. And they've also been a very good contributor. So it's not like we just sort of pull something out of a hat and said, let's just have, oh, this looks like a good idea. There's a lot of background information that's in there. And um, and Julian's more aware of me of what is actually in part two, and which isn't, so I'm being very cautious on some quotes in there. OK, well, I think, that, I think the point's been answered, so I'm going to move on to Dan. Um, I don't think I'm wrong in saying that this kind of reconsideration about what we want to do on that site and with office space is driven by the last year's experience. Um, the figure of expected working time in the office that's in the report and does touch on it in part two, but I'll skirt around that, is listed at kind of 50% um, is the assumption that we're working from. is. How confident are we that that figure is right for Harrow Council? Um, and will it allow us to deliver our current and importantly our future priorities? Because um, we're locking ourselves into a working practice here um, on, a, on a calculation that um, I hope you can shed light on. So Chair, would you like me to just comment on the report and the aspects there? I don't, I don't think that's, that bit is particularly commercially confidential. And then perhaps Charlie could comment on the um, um, uh, on the confidence and how suitable it is for Harrow. Great, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so you'll see that in the uh, Volterra report, uh, they have done some significant calculations uh, and they um, have examined the experience elsewhere and they conclude broadly that this is, this is a satisfactory uh, ambition. Uh, they do, if my uh, uh, memory serves me right, you know, do talk about it as ambitious. Uh, but it is not out of kilter and they record, of course, because they do a lot of research and, they, you know, to come back to Councillor Abadia's question, that's part of the reason for having these uh, firms on board is to, 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 to check that you are doing the right things. Uh, but they do trace the, um, uh, the, the reduction in the uh, amount of office space that people have required uh, over recent times. So um, uh, in terms of the report itself, um, I don't think there's any question at all that it supports uh, what the council's doing here. And um, uh, from my perspective, the advice uh, we've given is, uh, is, is is suitable for Harrow, but I'll perhaps bring Charlie in there. So on the um, suitability for Harrow, um, there was uh, investigation done on the number of people that were in the office uh, pre-COVID levels, um, which drove a numbers of people to seat ratio uh, that was looked at before and noting that the idea of going to agile and remote working for the council has been on the books for many many years um, and has been tried many times uh, the the civic center was and i can't remember the exact numbers but it was something like um only 40 percent to 50 percent occupied but sorry the other way around unoccupied so 50 to 60 percent occupied at the time which gives you about the numbers we're talking about for forward drive <clears throat> since then of course we've had covid19 as everyone knows the massive push of working at home which is one way of remote working it's not the only way of course um and all the indications from the staff surveys and feedback from forums etc has suggested that uh, 
that is absolutely right. People want to now have that flexibility of working from home. And in fact, I've been looking at um, public sector in other areas, plus the private sector numbers, and they're all driving in the same ways. So with all that data, we have a great confidence that what we're doing um, and the numbers of people that we're talking about for the office will make sense for Harrow Council. Great. Did you, did, sorry, Julian, did you want yeah, to it, it, it was just a very quick comeback, uh, Chair. I was less generous to uh, Volterra's wording than I might have been, actually. Mm. They do refer to 50% as optimal. Great. Uh, Dan, sorry, you got a follow up on that? Yeah, it's kind of just I did read the articles that were cited in the in the Volterra report and I was just concerned that the context of them and the dates of them um, maybe weren't too Harry specific. So I was just digging to see whether we thought that the information provided in those in that report com was com compatible with Harrow and its working practice and the type of activities that it does. Because I noticed that some of the reports are US based, some of them are financial firms in the city of London, which obviously have different commuting patterns than um, Harrow and Harrow Civic Centre. Um, so, and, you know, if you look and read some of the articles that they've used to cite support of it, the second half of the article has people saying that those reports perhaps aren't you know, be all and end all. So I just wanted to kind of dig into the compatibility of that with Harrow. And then kind of the second part of the question, and Charlie, thanks for your, your answer there, was around um, just, I think my concern as somebody who has been kind of forcibly working from home and talking to colleagues in my position is that the feeling and sentiment about the benefits of working from home have changed um, not only really over the last kind of year, but over the last six months, over the last three months, as this kind of has prolonged and the benefits of working in person in offices has become more apparent. Um, in terms of the surveys and the check ins and the focus groups that are going on with staff at the moment, um, has there been a track change in people's kind of keenness to get to this 50% level, which um, I, I'm not here to say whether it's ambitious or not, um, and just want to make sure that staff are still on track with that? Up, uh, yes, yes, Charlie. Um, so I think this, the change that has happened to cancelling since the last lockdown, the current lockdown, is that people have got totally fed up from only being able to work from home. Um, we are not in any way suggesting that people only work from home. Uh, we are suggesting that people are in at least forward drive. For those that are in forward drive, don't, don't forget we are not talking about all officers here we are just talking about those that are civic based of course um, but for those the feeling is that two to three days a week is good but they do want flexibility for the other days to be able to um, take their child to a gp's appointment take the car to the mot um, go and see clients go and see partners and do other things as well and uh, although there will be, and we are expecting it, a percentage, a very, very small percentage of people that wish to come in five days a week, that is not the feedback we are getting from staff. But they are fed up with working totally from home, which is why we're trying to open the Civic Hub up as soon as possible after lockdown ceases. Great. Is that OK, Dan? Yes, thank you. Thanks, thanks Charlie. OK. Um before I bring Stephen, I just want to ask a question around um, the split between Forward Drive and Harrow New Civic. And um, one of my concerns is that you have officers, you've got, because a lot of the council functions, the councillor functions will be at Harrow New Civic. And a lot of the running the council day to day is at Forward Drive. So where does that put senior officers are the senior officers uh looking to councillors at harrow new civic or to their team in in running it because councillors rely on senior officers to keep the council to keep the show on the road um but also we rely on senior officers to implement our policies so i just want an understanding around that split but also it, it came up in the casework i'm doing with uh, um in an email exchange I had with a, a fairly senior member of staff uh, and him telling me that he he learns a lot about what's going on by 
uh, as he comes in pre-COVID, uh, listening to the questions and comments coming into the front desk. This is a person that may be based in Ford Drive, whereas the front desk is that's not going to be in Ford Drive. It's going to be at Harrow Civic. So how how will both officers look both ways to councillors and and their staff, and how will officers ensure that they know what residents are thinking, especially those that don't live in the borough? And I'll bring that to Charlie. Uh, the leader might want to comment on the members' interaction with officers, but um, just to say that we are interacting at the moment, I believe. And yes. uh, we are doing it through a hybrid. Oh, sorry, we are doing it from, perfectly from uh, different locations. Um, don't forget, this is not about everybody working at home the whole time. This is two to three days in forward drive, and there is planned to be at this moment in time space within forward drive for members as well as officers. So one would hope that members may wish to come and continue to come even after the new Civic is open to forward drive. In addition, officers will be going to to the new Civic. Um, yes, the new Civic as well, certainly senior officers um, and working potentially sometimes there. This is about working in the best location for what you need to do, and that might be both. Additionally, we will have the ability to have hybrid meetings, which we really don't have at this moment in time. The hybrid meeting where some people are in a room together talking, a lot of people are not in the room talking. Um, and that's actually missed in Harrow, or how was pre-COVID, because we had a few conference call facilities, but that was about it, and even that was a bit ropey. So that will be a great benefit because we can get more people into the meeting, not less people into the meeting. So by the means of working in forward drive in the new Civic, where it's best to be so through virtual meetings, through hybrid meetings, I'd expect the interaction between officers and members to go up, not down with the open the new Civic. OK, I, I will I will bring Graham in, but I will before I do that, I'll, I'll abuse my position as chair a bit longer and, and, and come back. I mean, I, I totally, I think Charlie, you, you make a point about where the ideal is, but I think we all know that in reality, um, we don't work in ideals and where you are and people even in hot desking scenarios end up sitting at the same place they always do. And where you are has an impact on what you see and who you talk to and, and if senior officers, and if senior officers spend a lot of time in, um, Ford Drive and councillors who are not going to be in Ford Drive that much because they're often their interactions are in the evening are in meetings in Harrow New Civic. I, I do worry about the connections and and how how easy it is for councillors to to get get things done. So I, I do have a worry about. That. I'm going to bring Graham in on on, on the wider point I was making, and then I'll bring Julian in afterwards. You know, it's right to have concerns <coughs> about any sort of major change that's going to take place within an organisation. But it's also you need a lot of. Um, I don't like using blue sky thinking, but it's the sort of thinking that we've got to do things differently. And it goes back to um, Dan's point about, you know, people, some people sort of fed up being home five days a week, locked up and and um, the recent lockdown lasting from middle of December right through to near enough this week has caused people a lot of angst and sort of difficulty. And so I you know even now I sometimes go out to the Civic Centre on, on the basis just to sort of somewhere different, <laughs> although there's no one there. But the thing is, what I have found out is during COVID, it's the officers, the senior officers are more accessible since we've been in COVID because we've had access to the electronic communications as such, you know, like Teams meetings. Um, I've got so bad that I sometimes now just do phone calls. It's quite a, no a novel sort of thing to do. But you know, we I've had um, regular meetings with Sean every week, with Charlie, with Julian every other week, I think. And you know, and if I needed one, it's easier just to fit in, so not that far away. And I think going forward, it is around if I wanted to go and meet them, I can arrange to book the meeting room down the depot and go and see them down there, or vice versa. We could book the meeting rooms in the new Civic Centre when it's built and meet in there. So I think it, it's, it's added opportunity about how we can see each other more often, um, sometimes in a physical space. But it's understandable we're moving from a thing where the, where it's quite archaic in the working practices we had into something that sort of um, a more flexible way of working that needs a lot of support to get there. 
and that's what I was saying on this, the um, training and development program that's going to be in place to also sort of support people going forward. Thank but you. It, it is it is something that will be there, but we will. I think we'll probably meet each other more often in, in that sense. I look forward to those days. Uh, Julian. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, two things, if I may. The first was I just wanted to reiterate what Charlie said about options and indeed uh, the opportunity to meet each other more. Uh, it's worth just reminding ourselves that, you know, you'll have meeting rooms, uh, desk space, cafe space in the depot. Depending on the nature of the inquiry, you'll have private space, you'll have public space. I remember the days when members used to come in and stand by my desk, give me a list of things to do. Uh, so you'll have any range of option. And then uh, a similar uh, situation when the new civic centre is built. That again, you'll have cafe space, you'll have private meeting space, uh, and obviously you'll have the, the bigger rooms as well. So there really will be the opportunity for agile and flexible working uh, as the uh, as the philosophy says. Could I take the opportunity of just coming back? I'm conscious there was one point that Councillor Anderson raised that we didn't quite come back on, and this was about the harrow specificity of the study. Uh, and indeed, um, uh, th there were some criticisms in the, the uh, learned journals. And I, I think that's a very fair challenge. Um, but I think all I would say is that, first of all, um, I don't think in, in a study that only ever gave you the good things, you'd have uh, quite so much confidence in it. Um, and I mean, the, the Harris specificity point is a good point. But again, if we didn't look at the private sector and if we didn't look uh, nationally and nationwide, um, it probably wouldn't have the depth of the research. For example, if we only said it was going to be about Harrow or indeed even if it was only going to be about local government in North London, it probably wouldn't have the rigour uh, and um, uh, value that the study otherwise gets. So I think it's a fair challenge, but I think um, I, I, my advice to you would be to uh, rest on uh, Volterra's credentials, I think. Great. Charlie, did you want to come back or is that an old hand? Uh, thank you, Chair. No, it's just one point. Um, you mentioned, Chair, the fact that uh, members and officers mostly interact in the evening at meetings, and I would agree with that. There's not an enormous amount of interaction that goes on in the day in the civic centre that I've certainly seen and I've talked to many officers about it. Those meetings in the evening will continue. Well, we'd hope we'd have them during the day, but you know, probably not. They'll probably continue in the evening. And of course, we'll get more interaction because when I'm traveling, I'll be able to team into the hybrid meeting. And that's my exact point. And the, and the other bit is that through the additional spaces, perhaps we can meet more often face to face, but for specific pieces of work, which is what we lack at this moment in time. And lastly, as ward members, of course, the interaction there is I need to speak to an officer specifically about that. Well, it's much better to do it over a Teams call than a video uh, than a phone call, because at least you can see the officer in the eye. So perhaps there'll be more interaction that way as well. So, Chair, I hope your pessimism doesn't come to be and my optimism is more there because I do think we need those interactions to continue. Uh, I absolutely agree with you. Um, so I'm going to bring Stephen in now and then Canty after that. Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, there, there's something I wanted to clear up because um, the all the all the briefings that we've had and and the papers as well for this meeting indicate that um, that that a lot of a lot of services are going to be spread out um, uh, around the borough. Uh, we're not entirely sure where, um, but um, even 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 when we have the new buildings, the, the the indication is with especially with the the what's called the ancillary spaces program. That 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 was always understood to us to be to be a permanent thing, and this this is where they're going to be. Um, now um, the, the the leader has said a couple of times, I think two or three times, that um, he he's indicated that um, that on a more permanent basis, um, these are actually going to be consolidated um, into the civic centre, um, and that's a new thing. That that's not what we've heard. So um, I wanted to to, to just sort of get a confirmation as to what the position is, whether it's going to be they're going to be spread out around the borough or they're going to be brought into the civic centre. And if they are going to be brought into the civic centre, um, is 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 there going to be uh, has has space been allowed for in 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 the, in the new civic centre for those services? Who wants to answer that? I don't mind going first and I don't to come in straight after me <laughs> to correct anything I might say wrong. Um, 
I never said going to the civic centre. I said and said that <coughs> like we could move a lot of um, it's about using the collaborative space in a better way for managers to meet with their staff. I think what we're forgetting, and it's it it regularly happens this, that the council itself delivers a range, whole range of services, 365 days a year, 24/7. There's no doubt about that. And in COVID, I think we were more aware of that with people moving um, their hours of attendance and how they how they operated. Now, so most of those services are in quite a, probably a good proportion of those services are in public realm. So they do work the seven days and the staff are working accordingly. But what we've got to look at is the council's current operating models pre-COVID include as people working, including business support functions, is to generally traditionally work in uh, a nine to five in a fixed location at a desk. And what COVID has proven, you, it, because you have limited uh, um, capability to work efficiently and effectively in the communities that we really serve if we're just sticking to nine to five Monday to Friday. And that's what came quite apparent very early on in the middle of in, in COVID. Because I was having conference calls on a Sunday afternoon with the adult social care team and you know we're trying to resolve situations and there's other people in this room who are doing the same thing. So the, the organisation wants to change and it, it, it's and most businesses around the country have changed already. They've gone into this process and you know, they're working in that way. What we're looking at is. Is half the time spending time within um, the collaborative space as such or in the meetings rooms in, in the depot, you'd arrange your diary around it and then have a more flexible approach about the other parts of the work that are actually being done. Now this used to be done within the planning team for a number of years um, where they used to come in on a Saturday. They didn't advertise they were there, they advertised a phone call Monday to Friday and they operated on a Saturday. A lot of our care work um, housing team used to work on weekends just to catch up with workload as a flexible way of working. This is actually putting that place in place. So when I say about working as a council, we are I say we're working in the borough. It doesn't mean you have to be in the borough when you're working. You now people could go, you could be sort of um, spend time out and you could have peace and quiet one day a week working remotely and then you can go back into the meetings and be properly prepared for it. So it is having that flexible approach unless we actually understand that part of it. It's that fixed desk approach we got for only part of the organisation to move more flexibly like the rest of the organisation, then we can actually move forward. Um, I think we probably want an officer just to confirm the temporary versus permanent point. Raheem. Ooh. Chair Julian might want to talk about the space that's available in the new Civic and the flexibility of that space. Why not? So um, I think the um, the situation as we stand here at the moment is that uh, as per the briefings, uh, most of the things we're talking about are intended to be permanent, but there will be uh, a meeting space in the uh, new Civic and the um, pick it up on the emergency points, you know, the security or otherwise of that space can still be varied and there will, as I've said in other places, be a, a reception point. I wouldn't necessarily assume that it will be in the form that you know at the moment, but there will be the opportunity for people to be uh, to be met there. So, uh, you know, there are some services that will go. Of course, anything can be um, uh, uh, added in and changed. Um, but of course, uh, you know, once we get to a point where uh, decisions are made. First of all, you've got a you've got a clear budget coming up now, and secondly, of course, you know there will come a point where you go through your design process and you're building further. But there is still obviously the opportunity to change things uh, should you so desire. Um, in terms of the space as it stands in the concept that we currently have, there is a certain amount of flexibility. Um, in fact, um, uh, I think. And I use this only by way as it, by way of example. This is not a, but you know, if you were to choose to accommodate the registrars, for example, in the building, then I think that could uh, prob could almost certainly be accommodated. Uh, what what you clearly couldn't do is bring uh, you know l large numbers of additional services in. Uh, so there is certainly flexibility within the scheme at the moment. But what you are setting, frankly, is an envelope, and that envelope is around twenty thousand square foot. Yeah, see, see, see. This is my concern. We're not. There isn't. There has. There's. There's a. There's a lack of clarity. I mean, we're talking about 
front of house council services that you know obviously there are some there are there there are some departments where yes you know you could you could you know the people in those departments can work flexibly flexibly around around different places when you're talking about front of house services like the registrars like the um the, the the social care front of house like the homelessness interactions with residents the you know the front of house access harrow those have to be located in fixed places you know you can't flex those around the borough they, they they've got to be put in fixed locations and i'm trying to get an answer as to because i'm hearing different answers all the time as to because I, I thought there was a program to to put those in different places around the borough i'm hearing some some answers that suggest they might be put in the civic centre. I'm just trying to get an answer as to where these where these places are going to be, um, you know, and 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 I, I'm just not getting it. Charlie, so to try and help the councillor, I repeat what I said before. So, planned social care interactions are going to be within the people's estate that currently already have, and that will be permanent. As permanent as the world ever is, <laughs> you know, it's five years till the civic centre potentially opens. <laughs> yeah. Emergency social care and homelessness join together as the residents of sit, or as it looks like it's a better model at some place still to be determined within the borough, not the new civic because it won't be open in time. The registrars potentially to Headstone Manor to be confirmed but that looks like it's a win-win both for the service and residents there and no doubt because it will be a win-win that's where we'll want to keep it permanently but again five years is a long time in the name the general very small what's left of uh, the interactions at the front desk which is mainly about housing and council tax will be trialed within the library if that is successful and agreed by cabinet that will be a future people coming up then that's what we will do as the new model going forward for that general information to residents across libraries permanent one presumes until the world moves on again and things change and we want to do something different thank you so so in that so so in that respect things are being being spread across the borough you might say that that's that's a that's that's a good thing but i think i think in terms of a fact these things are being spread across the borough and we can't be hearing suggestions that that they're we can't, we, we can't be hearing you know people saying that they're that they're not going to be when when they are um i mean obviously some of the things we might have some idea where they're going to be and some of the things we don't but um i think that 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 seems to be established so uh which which is um you know it'd be it's 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 a shame we don't have the full as i said the full full details of that but um i just um just sort of picking up on 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 uh, something else about the whole uh, working from home issue. Um, I, I I like like Councillor Anderson and um, and the query by Councillor Butterworth. Um, I I do have concerns that we seem to be baking in this um, this sort of really untested idea that you know on a long term on to, you know the, the, on a on a permanent long term basis. Um, we are going to be, um, you know, people are going to be working from home two or three days a week and, and flexing around the place. Um, when we don't really know if that if that's going to work long term, and we seem to be designing our infrastructure and our and our space um, around that to the extent that if. So, my question is really, if we if we find in the coming you know months and years that actually. Um, that doesn't work um, in terms of you know all sorts of things in terms of productivity, uh, in terms of um, you know people's work patterns. Um, what do we do? Because we've we will seemingly have you know there, there won't be space to expand. You know we'll have more staff in the office more of the time. So what what do we do if that we find that doesn't work? Who wants to take that, Charlie? To start with, uh, happy to chair. So to say we haven't tested it the grades the fact that we've been working at home during the pandemic period for a year now um, so technically we can work at home practically we can work at home um, emotionally I agree there is a problem with a lot of people working at home that's why we're going for two to three days in an office so people can get out of it so I think that's been well tested we will test some of the details of how that will work as the Civic Hub opens up in the end of June. 
And if it all doesn't work at the end of the day in five years time and something else comes along, well, things change anyway. So you'd move on from that point of view. But at this moment in time, we have proven that we can work agile and remotely technology wise and ability wise. Productivity is actually the amount of times that people are speaking and talking has actually gone up in that way. Productivity as in sometimes you need to see people in eye to eye. No is not there. But once again, that's why collaborative space is there for two to three days a week. Graham. Yes, I want to challenge this point uh, or perception that there's thousands of people queuing up at the Civic Centre every day. Now, this might have been the case 20 years ago when <coughs> it was done on paper form and sort of accessibility. But, you know, housing benefit only online, government's IT strategy, even registering to vote only online. When you look at schools admissions policies, everyone applies online. There's no sort of paper forms anymore. So all these things are done online. And um, Jonathan Milburn has gone through all this to say there's very few people actually act come in to access services. So the options we're talking about is if someone was struggling with their housing benefit or something like that and getting stuck on the phone, it'd be easier if they could go in and produce documentation at a library, which is closer to home, rather than having to trace all the way out to the civic centre, put it in the envelope in the box because you can't meet anyone there and then sort of wait for a response. So it's about making it easier for the residents as well. And it is this point about um, and when we talk about the 50 percent level, um, with your long memory of um, history, I remember going to Cabinet back in 2011, I think probably. Actually, it was around this time of year when we moved the mobile and flex strategy, which said a lot of it relied on people um, on the desk space, which reduced the ratio down to, um, was it the five in five in ten at the time or what one? So most people work in either two or three days a week in the civic centre, the rest of it working remotely for the reasons that actually have been outlined in this report. You see that in the same, but at the time they needed quite big serious upgrades in um, the IT um, capability, which is now available. And since that IT has been um, proven, when we first went into COVID, they were given the old dodgy laptops uh, that have been in the cupboard for some time. But when they moved over to the upgrades and, and this future upgrades coming through, it makes it more easier and accessible. More people are sort of want that remote sort of access, um, remote working capability with some days going in to sort of catch up with those sort of um, to get that, have that conversations and talk through issues and problems they might have. But if you look at it, just one final point, when we talk about adult social care, people don't go into the civic centre to access adult social care. So when the, the person goes out to see them and writes the report and then goes back to the civic centre and types it up, but at the moment they go home and type it up. With the new technology, because it's secure, they can do that all online and line it all up. So there isn't this number of people <coughs> going into the civic centre to access council services. Okay. Julian, I can see your hand up. Have you got anything new? I uh, well, I, uh, whether it's new chair is a good question, but I, I did have a couple of points in support of Charlie. Uh, one was just to say, of course, what Volterra does very clearly say is that the reduction in space requirements and the reduction of office hours is not new and has been a trend for some time. Uh, you yourselves, of course, uh, had also already embarked on a uh, agile and flexible working and in that sense the experience of the last 12 months has only exacerbated rather than that than brought it in new um, and the final point that is worth bearing in mind is that you'll recall we had a survey of the occupation of the present Poets Corner and with some significantly rare exceptions occupation is only at 50 percent so um, in the same way as the leader says you know people are not queuing to get in the building neither necessarily uh, is the accommodation and the staff uh, aligned even pre-COVID? Okay, thank you. I'm going to, as it's 10, 10, past, uh, 10 past time, I'm going to move swiftly on to uh, Candy and then to Chris. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll try and have sort of short, quick questions so we can sort of move on, as you rightly said. Um, uh, because I think we haven't explored the financial side, so I'm going to touch on that. But before I jump onto that, um, in terms of the report, and uh, you know, I understand that the councils kind of relied on the credibility of Volterra, which is not a problem. But Dan raised the problem I had with this report, and I, I don't know how much detail was reviewed here. One of the problems I have is that, as Dan rightly said, 
you are referring to the US, the, the footnotes, if you read them, they're not really clear where the uh, information comes from, you know, Forbes, which edition, which, because I was trying to see, can I kind of find the same information, some which I expect, but I can't because the footnotes are not correct. Um, you know, the situation where one place of the report says that we go 1132 employees, for example, and then we're expecting assumption of 50%, which is 566. Uh, but, you know, the report's working out on 663 example. Uh, I'm not saying these are major decisions, but, you know, my concern about inconsistency of this uh, kind of, you know, how it's been dealt with, uh, because clearly I had a problem with kind of, you know, relating this back to Haro, you know, say why this is relevant. So um, it's just sort of mentioning what Dan said and we heard the Julian's response, but I have a concern there's a fair bit of inconsistency. It also mentions a different saving from the one we saw last week. And it also sort of uh, the report from Savills got a slightly different figure of what we're actually saving. So my point was just, you know, connecting all the dots. It doesn't do that. Unfortunately, the various reports talk of different things. Um, I'm just going to park to the side so in case you're going to be coming there at this to part two, we can take it up there. But if, if Dawn's there, uh, Dawn, one of the things I picked up from here is that our maximum or a peak borrowing requirement will be 30 million. When we kind of looked at this uh, beforehand, um, you know, at the tendering stage, because we haven't had business plans, which is a concern, and uh, you know, I understand that down the line, but would rather have them here, was 22.45 million, Don. So if our sort of requirements are less now, because you know, the, we're scaling down, why is the borrowing requirements gone up by nearly 8 million? Keep borrowing requirements. Do you want, do you want me to answer that, Julian? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a finance question, so. Yeah, we'll... Yes, that's fine. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll check specifically on the 22 million, but I think it's just, um, I think it's, it, we've just got to accept that the, 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 that, that is the modelling as it stands at the moment in terms of the peak uh, debt coming out at that date. Yeah. So now I will emphasize is that, uh, you know, it will have helped us if we had an overall business plan again. Um, just quickly jumping to sort of in terms of the costings of the changes in costing, Julian. So obviously, you know, we've got lower floor space and I saw figures of 325,000 and 345,000 per unit. So one, I didn't understand why we're going accepted at a higher value, 345 rather than 325, which is at the tendering stage per unit. So, Chair, the, um, uh, those figures relate to the grant levels, uh, sorry, to the costs at which grant levels are awarded uh, by the GLA and the GLA assumptions. Uh, and you'll recall in our very opening remarks, we said that uh, there was further due diligence to be done on the HRA uh, before we actually committed to those, but there was the opportunity for affordable housing. Uh, I mean, there are two things. First of all, uh, the cost assumptions that are made uh, in the fullness of time uh, by the GLA may be different than those are now. Uh, but the point is, as we said, we're at a very early design stage here uh, and that um, uh, the figures that ultimately come out uh, may be less than those. Uh, but for the purposes of this assumption, uh, that's the number we've taken. Uh, I was just trying to um, get through the Volterra report to try and align uh, the numbers um, that um, Councillor Abadio refers to. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that he is simply dividing the total number of staff and the 663 is the amount of work settings that we put in place. Uh, but I am uh, just trying to do that. So uh, if you wanted to take another question, Chair, um, I'll, uh, I'll deal with that while we're looking. Yeah, and also, Julian, how does that cost of 345 or 325, doesn't matter where you take, uh, you know, relate to the costings that's given in the Savills report, for example, because I couldn't match it to or how we do because a bit of background has been useful because we all are lay people and, you know, these are specialist reports. So if you're going to do justice to scrutiny, then, you know, that's required. So I couldn't do that. You don't have to give me an answer now, but it's something we'll be looking to. Um, my third question regarding the same issue. So the 345,000 cost per unit would be, I understand, correct if you're looking at the whole situation. Now, when you take off floors, my understanding was your major cost is in your foundation. So I expected the cost to come down. So if that was the case, your savings would be much less than, you know, this 15 or 17, depending on which you, you take. 
figures. So we would need clarity on that. So I don't know if you've got an answer to so that right now. Just, just to be clear, I think there is some misunderstanding here. The 345 is the cost assumption oh, you need. That the, that the GLA oh, makes on the housing block. It is of no be bearing to the HNC. OK, now I don't know if you understood my question, Julian. Sorry, what I'm just saying is the veracity of these costings because I am not getting it. I'm not being able to connect it. I understand we've got expert reports. I'm a lay people, so I'm just simplifying it to the core and say, you know, how does this stack up from a basic viewpoint? If you don't have an answer, that's fine, but I'm just saying it's something we really need to kind of get to the bottom of and a, a business plan which in its entire totality would you know, stop some of these questions, I suppose. So, Chair, maybe Dawn can explain it better than me. <laughs> Is that OK, Chair? Yes, please. I think, I think on the, the 345 and the 325, I think I think it's, it's, it's a simple answer. What we're saying is at the moment, the HR business plan assumes, so the HR business plan that's gone through to Cabinet assumes uh, a, an average unit price of 325k per affordable housing unit. What we're saying at the moment is the current viability model that we're, we're looking at here assumes 300 it is, is coming out at a costing of 345 per per unit of affordable housing. So what we're saying in this report is there is clearly a difference. But as we've clearly stated in the report, we are very much at the beginning of the design stage. There is a lot of due diligence to do in terms of the affordable housing units and the HRA, and that will have to be worked through before the scheme, before basically the button is pressed on the scheme. So that is the difference between the two costs at the moment. Okay. So just just to understand that, Don. So our initial projections when we started this process was three to five. So we believe that budget's going to go no. up now. No, it's not. It's not an initial. It's not an initial projection. What we have is we have a HRA business plan. And when that HRA business plan is set um, every three years, so obviously it's making assumptions going forward. They have an assumption about six, I think it's 630, 630 something properties as part of the building council homes scheme. And for those schemes that are still in plan, they, they make an assumption about an average unit cost for each for each unit. So the assumption in the HRA business plan is 325 and that is an average. Some will come lower than that. Some might come a little bit higher than that, depending on spec, size, number of bedrooms, etc. So that is the assumption in the HRA business plan. What we're saying at the moment here is the assumption per the viability model is that the unit cost is coming out at three, at three, four, five. So there clearly is a difference. And that's why what we're saying is really on this, on the affordable units, there is work to be done with the HRA to clarify that as Julian's always mentioned about the due diligence, to make sure that those costs either come within the average 325 or if it's if it slightly changes from that 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 will be a decision that is made before the scheme goes ahead right thank you dan so obviously we're looking forward to an extensive business plan with all the figures and obviously you know we might well, just get a better picture the, the, business, the business plan for the hsdp will be coming is that is that correct it's going to be coming in the june report yeah. And then obviously, so that that will be the extensive business plan. Um, you know, so you will be able to see that in its entirety. What you're seeing in this report is some extracts from the business plan. In terms of the HRA, there will obviously have to be a separate, a separate piece of work as that due diligence goes through to either align them unit cost prices or come to a unit cost price that is that is affordable within the HRA for the for the affordable units. Uh, sorry, Julian, you got something to add? I had another connected question. Go on, sorry, Julian. Uh, I was, I was. If if you're happy now on the uh, the housing assumptions, I was just going to deal with your question about the one one three two and the six three two. This is oh, in oh, the <laughs> sorry. this is in the civic workspace requirement, and this is uh, Volterra three ten. What they are basically saying, and this is true, is that in the original strategic brief. Uh, they as the assumption was that they would deal with an office headcount of 1132 on an average day, 220 of which would be based elsewhere, uh, and then were various assumptions made. Um, and the key assumption driving that was that 20% of the staff would be spent working remotely at any one time. Bear in mind that we have now uh, increased that to uh, effectively to, to 50%. Um, they um, uh, are saying that um, assuming all the other options, they are saying that the uh, the headcount now needed to be supported based on the ratio 
is uh, 663. Uh, they say there's even assuming a 10% comfort factor to ensure flexibility, which would be uh, 66 extra workspaces. That would be 720 workspaces. In actual fact, if you take all the potential workspaces uh, in four-wheel drive, and of course the calculation then moves across the HNC as well, there are effectively a thousand workspaces. So there is more than enough accommodation to cater for those required in the council uh, at both forward drive and in the space currently predicted. Okay. Um, Dawn, are you there still? Sorry. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi. It I'm just recollecting a, a, a session we had on this finance side of things um, and looking at it from the table here tabulated here in terms of the dividends and all. And so my understanding was that we're setting up a joint venture that's a limited liability partnership. So my understanding is limited liability partnerships don't give out dividends, they give out uh, profits. Um, so unless you're saying you're going to get profits in all those years, um, I understand the interest they're returning, which is separate from the dividend um, um, sort of thing. Uh, and then effectively, the plan was when you liquidate the LLP, that's when you release the dividend, not throughout the year. And, you know, the idea was that it's not really a, a dividend or anything. It's a distribution of what's left after everything. But this model in here in the papers seems to suggest something different, and which also then asks the question then, how we accounted for taxation? Because if you're going to get that income every year, then you need a reduction for tax, don't you? Don't. Don't you unmute. Sorry, Chair. What these dividends are is that they are the money, and I, I speak in council speak, so if Ishdeep is on the phone and I get this wrong in terms of proper language, please, please, please jump in. These, this sure. is the money that we will get in from the JV into the council um, as the units are sold within within the partnership arrangement. Um, so it will be our share of um of the of the um returns from the sales of those properties the tax implications have, have already been uh, will have been have been sort of accounted for in terms of how we will get them um now we can we can provide some more assurance on them and we, we obviously we asked that we are looking at all the tax arrangement but the llp has been set up in the most tax efficient way so similar to the llp that we have for gate and road um in the company structure to make sure that the dividend um com comes across to the council Right. OK, now, like I said, I mean, let's look at the, you know, extensive business because then probably then hopefully clarifies a few things. I think I think and if that tax to, analysis could be included, please. Katie, I think we can come back to that point when we look at the um, contract close, because it might just be a language issue of distribution mm. of profits versus dividends. Mm. I suspect it's distribution of profits rather than dividends, but dividends are being used. Mm. Um, but we will just if we double check that and bring that back when we look at contract close. Sure. And I'll, I'll check that as well, Chair, just to make sure that that the that that we've got the language right. Yeah. Is that Tanti, is that okay? For now, yes. Someone wants to jump in. I, uh, Chris did have his hands up. Chris his hand, hand, hand up, yeah. His hand's gone down again, but it's gone up. Okay, Chris. I, I only put it down because it kept sitting in front of my nose on my screen. It was annoying me. Right. Um, simple, simple question, and thank you for all, everyone who's asked the questions because most of the things I was going to ask, everyone's asked anyway. Um, so that's fine. One of the things when we talk about flexible working, and I'm very happy to go flexible working, is it must be done to the council's needs, not necessarily the staff needs. So that if we need people on certain days, they need to come in there, not, oh, well, I'm going to have that one day off and work at home. And as long as that works to our benefit, then it's the right way to work. Um, we've got to look after staff, and I completely agree with that and work it, but we do need to get the system working to the best benefit for the council, because the council is there to look after the members of the public. That's what we're all paid for. That's what we should all be doing. Anyway, I don't know whether... Um, I, I a statement a rather than a question. Straight away to answer that. Yeah, a statement rather than a question, but Charlie might be able to... Well, here's a question. Are we going to do it? Great. Okay. Great. Okay. So, I mean, the, the short answer is agreed. The, the long answer is that people wish flexibility in their time that they work and where they work, but that's as a requirement of what the service residents need from those people. Fine. Great. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, I'm just going to bring Stephen in in a second, but uh, before I do, I just want to come back to uh, Dawn. We'll get Dawn warmed up on finances. So I just want to go back to the finances for a second and on the fit out of forward drive. Mm -hmm. uh, Ten million pounds is a lot of money. I know the prime minister has gold wallpaper. Um, it does. The numbers did look rather large to me. Can we can you just explain how we've got to that number? Um, I can't. Do you best to answer this one in terms of specifics of what's in there? Oh, hold on. I oh, know I can. I can give you the specifics of what we've got. Um, is it split out between fit out, moving, etc.? If you can just bear with me a moment. Yeah, that's fine. Um, Chairman, we've got platinum wallpaper. That's why. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure that I'm sure the council taxpayers of Harrow will be very impressed. So, in terms of I mean, Julian can probably say this better than me, and, and maybe Charlie wants to come in. But this is this is not, you know, this is not a, a an extravagant fit out. So I can assure you that we're not having we're not having um we're not having um excessive wallpaper. What what that what that amount covers is it covers. Um, sorry, I'm just getting the numbers up so I don't tell you the incorrect information. The biggest chunk, the biggest um element of that funding is to cover. The, um, is to cover the fit out cost. So that's around about five million pounds and Julian can take you through the details of what that covers. We've got a sum in there that covers us for Kia's cost claims, which we'll have to talk about in terms of um, in terms of part two. Okay. We have about four hundred thousand pounds that's covered in there that will cover the 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 LAN arrangements, the, um, the local area network arrangements, which there is budget currently in the IT for. There's a similar sum that and there's a similar sum that covers um, in that in that large figure that covers the audio visual requirements. Um, and and then obviously we have the 725 that's isolated out for for the revenue impacts of moving and the, the the looking at the ancillary spaces that we've talked about previously. OK, and then so Julian can help us on the five million. So the yeah. big chunk of that. Now, because I'm just I'm just going to find. So yeah, Chair, um, while, while Dawn's looking, so I mean, worth remembering this 38,000 square foot of office mm -hmm. floor space. Uh, so it's um, a, a considerable amount of space, 813 work settings. Uh, the furniture and fittings, the loose furniture and fittings is being procured. Uh, obviously there's welfare facilities in the cafe. Um, so um, the, uh, Ground floor entrance holds the cafe and well facility facilities um, with the. Uh, obviously the arrivals and reception area, uh, IT and audio visual as uh, Dawn has mentioned. Um, see some some of this covers fit out of the CCTV room, um, although obviously a substantial chunk of that is already uh, taken into account in the construction. Um, the. Um, Obviously, the uh, the fixed fittings, the uh, um, toilets and uh, uh, showers and muster rooms, uh, the various ranges of uh, uh, fixed fittings, vertical and horizontal circulation. Uh, there's the um, building management software, uh, and of course the, um, the the mechanical and electrical, which in a building of this size and space is a significant component uh, thereof. Um, so, I mean, those are the key issues. As Dawn says, there's a chunk in there that we would need to talk about in private. Um, so a significant uh, amount of uh, fixtures and fittings. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, I wonder whether um, as part of the informal sessions uh, as contractors, we can get a bit of an understanding of benchmarking where, because if that's if that's a, a good benchmark of how much <laughs> Uh, 38,000 square uh, feet of floor space cost then then fine but I would like to see because I yeah. I, I do want to be able to justify that number yeah so I can cert I can certainly set that out for you in writing I can tell you that it is within benchmark it is at the it's at the higher end of benchmark but it is within benchmark we can certainly set that out for you fantastic uh, Stephen um thank you very much that that leads quite neatly on to my question um, on on page 16, in relation to the cost of the of the Harrow New Civic, which is now I think 22 million, or roughly 22 million, um, it says that the fit out costs of um, 
of of that building um, haven't been taken to, into account and would be on top of that. So would we be expecting um, a similar level of a fit out cost for Harrow New Civic as we would do for um, for for forward drive? I mean, can we assume it's going to cost another eight to ten million to fit it out? So a very simple answer to that chair is no, uh, because uh, the uh, costings for the uh, had a new Civic assume a category B fit out. So the only additional stuff you would be getting there would be the loose furniture and those things. Uh, so the short answer is no. Uh, this the uh, the uh, the uh, specification is already more advanced. So so when it says on page 16, it is accepted the council will incur additional fit out costs for the HNC. That that refers to the loose fittings and things like that. Essentially, it's FF and E. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, is is that is that a, is that a meaningful cost, or what, I mean, are we are we expecting more cost there, or? Well, I think it's difficult for me to assume um, what the costs of furniture and fittings will be five years hence. Mm. Uh, in private, I'll tell you what the budget cost for the uh, FF and E at the depot is to give you a clue. But I don't think I should say that in public forum for procurement reasons. Right. OK, OK, well, well, well thank you for that. I mean, uh, what, 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 I, what I was trying to do, uh, what I've been trying to do is, is kind of tot up exactly how much the accommodation strategy is costing. So we've got the we've got the, 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 the 22 million of the um, of, of the HNC. Um, I, I was I was just trying to get a, a, an idea of, of, of the fit out costs for that. Um, obviously, you know, we'll, we'll have to we'll have to assume for the moment they might be negligible. Um, but in in um, on on page eighteen, I, I note that that, it, that if you if you include the the um, in terms of forward drive, if you include you know all the costs of the original depot project um, the, and now the additional uh, fit fit out costs, um, that that's now that's now risen to to, to forty four million. I think I think the last time we heard it was it, it was around thirty five million. So it, it it's gone up to that. So if you add those together. Uh, you get to about 66 million um, and then you've got the the ancillary sites work which is another half million um, there's also uncertainty as to whether um, there's that's going to cost more um, so that could potentially go up to, 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 to be more than that so would it be would it be correct to assume that the the total cost of the accommodation strategy is is around about the, the 70 million mark so I think the, um, the the first thing to say is no, mm. uh, because um, a substantial chunk of the uh, depot was already uh, underway, and indeed a, a further substantial chunk of the depot uh, has no bearing whatever on the accommodation strategy um, in terms of the uh, car parking and the um, uh, workshops and uh, similar buildings. So uh, no, I mean. Um, uh, as to what proportion exactly uh, you could you could legitimately attribute, but I, I would essentially, con uh, and Dawn may want to add, I would essentially uh, stick to what she's including the financial implications. Dawn. Yeah, I think just to, I think just to add to that, I think that's fair to say yeah. that that the original cost of the depot, the depot was built for the replacement of the depot, so we wouldn't include that. And I think what's also important is what we have to bear in mind that we are going to get returns from this arrangement that will net off against um, the cost of the civic centre and such that we are paying. Now we are detailing those, those are what we're classing as a JV dividends. We are detailing those in the in the report. So we would have to take all, all the returns we are going to get back from the arrangement as well um, when we're looking at the overall cost. Right, but um, so well, so thank you for that. I mean, what 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 I'm trying to get is so, in terms of the actual, um, in terms of what what's being built um, at Forward Drive, um, in terms of what the what the council is going to use for its civic offices, what proportion of the I think I think the the original depot cost is quoted here because I'm I'm quoting from the financial implications. Mm -hmm. The um, the the it, it quotes the original depot project cost as as, as 33 million. Mm -hmm. Um, or nearly nearly 34 million. Um, at, so what what proportion of that then is <coughs> was funded the building of these of, of the offices that the civics going to use? Yeah. So so the additional 
thinking, thinking if recall from memory, the additional two floors came in and, and the additional floor of the car parking came at additional co capital cost of five million. So when, so when we applied to extend the depot to put the two extra floors on, that was additional capital cost of um, a five million pounds. So it's five million for those two floors. And what about the other floor? Because I think the council's going to use other floors in that building as well. It's not just going to use two floors. Or is it just going to use two floors in that building? Uh, it is, but it was always going to remember. Yeah, it was. Right, so it's five. So so the council's only going to use two floors, the top two floors in that block. Is that correct? No. Mm -hmm. Right. So that so the five million covers the, the top two floors in that block, which is the additional bit. Yeah. But of the original um, of the, the, the council is also going to use um, some of the original build out of of the depot project so how so how much did that cost i think i think the original the original building was included two floors of, of accommodation and help me out with you if i got it wrong julian so they were already good some of the some of that space was already going to be used by the council Correct. what we've done is we applied to extend the building by two floors which an extra cost of five million and to 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 house for the to for the for the rest of the council staff now so we were already so hence, really, the additional is really the um, is I think it's fair to say is, is the five million pounds. Yeah, and you're yeah. making significantly better use of the building yeah. by the intensification of the numbers you're having in there. The the new building is a five story building, and um, a number of floors were going to be let out commercially, and they're not now. They're going to be let out. They're going to be used by the council. I think it's maybe one or two floors. So, um, so you know. If we're if if we're applying, if we're looking at how much this is this is costing us to to move there, um, we would need to attribute that cost to this project as well. Um, so you know, do we know what the cost of that is? Well, the the cost of doing the two extra floors was the five million pounds. Yes. Now the, orig the original intention was to you know being honest, the original intention was that to be income generating. That that plan has now changed. But the original that that that's the top two floors mm. the three floors underneath some of those were going to be let out commercially and they're mm. now going to be used for this for the civic mm. um function mm. so I think the answer is no I, mm. I think the only the top two were ever mm. going to be rented out i think that's no the top two weren't going to be rented out the, the the top two um when they went when 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 they went for planning um, it specifically said they weren't going to be rent out and they were going to be used for civic offices. The the there were there, there was a plan to um to to rent out office to, to rent out commercial office space in some of the in 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 some of the floors underneath. Um so, and now they're going to be used as 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 uh, as, as council. Chair, um if I may, certainly within my time when I've been helping you, there's never been a plan for office space on the ground first or second floor. The first and second floor were going to be used mm. for uh, uh, CCTV uh, plus um, uh, council office space. Uh, there are, of course, commercial lets in the workshops on the mm. ground floor, but I think that's something different. Mm. And the third floor? Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get a thing. And the third floor was the same. Third floor was office accommodation as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. That um, I'm sorry. That that's that's that 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 wasn't the understanding because you know we went through this a lot on 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 the planning committee. But um, you know that that, that was not going to. It, it was it was never the intention to use the whole building for for uh, for, for civic use. There was going to be some commercial um, uh, element in there, and it's not now. And if that's if there's if if you're saying something different now, that's a rewriting of history. Um, but um, well, anyway, so um, so so uh, mo moving on then um, in terms of the um, in terms of the uh, uh, looking at the the, the, the parking implications, um, obviously, you know, we're, we're spending um, 22 million pounds on a on a on a new civic center. Um, we for various reasons have heard that 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 apparently 40 spaces can own uh, only 40 parking spaces can be put in the building. Um, how accessible is that going to be for its use? And are we at risk of building a 22 
million pound civic centre that people can't get to. So, Chair, I wonder, they've waited very patiently, but I wonder whether in terms of the accessibility of the car parking space, this is the moment to bring weights in and to ask Bahija to comment. Oh, why not? Why not, Bahija? We'll bring you in right right <laughs> towards the end, but Bahija, the floor's yours. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you, Julian. Um, yes, yeah, so in relation to the, the car parking, the, there are two elements to the car parking proposed. There will be a number of accessible spaces located at um, ground floor level um, and then there would also be as, as Julian mentioned earlier the 40 spaces within the basement car park those 40 spaces within the basement car park are all earmarked to be for use of uh, related to uses of the the civic centre so whether those are staff or visitors or or members particularly if you were to have meetings in the evening when they're less likely to be members of the public visiting the site yeah, uh, well, I mean, th th thank you for that. I mean, if you're looking at council meetings, for starters, there's going to be 55 councillors and only 40 spaces. So there's already fewer than we actually need, um, considering that when you have council meetings late at night, people aren't necessarily going to be, um, it's not necessarily going to be appropriate for people to be hopping on, you know, two or three buses to get home um, around the borough. Um, so you know I'm, i i i don't get a sense that there's it's been properly thought through in terms of you know how 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 it is fit for purpose to have to have such a small number of of, of spaces um and um you know i i i find it um and perhaps you'll, you'll be you'll be able to comment on this um i noticed in the papers that there's uh, you're now planning to come back with a with a with a with a parking strategy and my understanding was that was that a parking strategy because i've been asking about this for years that a parking strategy was going to be ready well in advance of any consideration of an accommodation strategy so um you know i, I again it's coming back to why are we trying to put through an accommodation strategy when we don't have all this information ready so chair i think um Two things, if I may. First of all, uh, I mean, in terms of why it's only feasible to uh, build 40 in the basement, I'll let Bahija comment. But in terms of uh, the um, uh, uh, the actual uh, position on terms of the numbers, uh, Councillor Greek is well aware of my advice, and it's probably fair to say we simply disagree on it, which is that um, uh, my understanding of the planning position, given that um, the um, in town centre sites with a high detail area, uh, the expectation is that even new developments will be car free. Uh, the, uh, the the position that uh, uh, the partnership has or the partnership to be is getting to is that um, uh, 40 spaces plus the six at ground level uh, is a reasonable expectation of flexibility. And uh, of course, I've made the point to him that um, uh, it is uh, legitimate for the council if it wishes to try and uh, push the envelope of that uh, uh, provision, uh, but that's my understanding of where of where the planning position will be, and uh, I can probably say no more than that. In terms of the strategy, uh, yes, he's quite right. He has been pushing this for some time. Um, I I would that the strategy could be more specific, uh, but as the report says, oh, a detail a detailed review of the opportunities in the Woodstone area uh, has been carried out, uh, and in essence. The proposals that you have before you, which are listed in the report, are all all there is, and uh, uh, that that is uh, as uh, uh, you know we, the council's uh, undertaking to uh, to take those forward and see if they can make them uh, work. There are a significant number of spaces at the depot, um, but uh, of course we are in a different planning position and we are in a different um, uh, uh, climate environment than you were when you first set out on this journey. I think the, the final thing I'd say, because um, um, we, we have uh, debated the car parking provision at length, but of course I, I cannot sit here and pretend to you uh, that developing on a large number of cars parking space doesn't lead to a reduction. Uh, you know, that is a fact. The maths are as the maths. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully that helps, although I, I know well enough that I would not have persuaded the council on this particular matter. No, I, I mean, well, so I think we obviously we 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 
it's right to say we we disagree about the um, about it to a certain extent on on the planning constraints, and I've suggested we we could push the envelope. But it, I wasn't really asking about that. I mean, I, I've kind of taken as read that your your position on um, on 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 the constraint. But what I'm asking is, how does that make this how does that make this civic centre fit for purpose? If if it can't even fulfil the basic infrastructure need in the sense that of of having enough. Um, uh, uh, of having enough provision for for people to be able to get there, you know, for meetings at night, and then for people to be able to, um, you know, for, for, for when when people finish their meetings at night to be able to uh, go home safely. How how does it even meet that basic need? You know, what you know, how how is how 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 is it fit for purpose given given that situation? So I. I mean, again, we're going to, I suspect, agree to disagree, uh, and I don't know if uh, Charlie or anybody else wants to add further comments, uh, but I, I do not see and wouldn't advise you that a building lacks fit for purpose because of a limited amount of car parking spaces. There are many uh, civic centres in London and elsewhere that have far less than the number of uh, people coming to a particular meeting, and uh, the, the P-Tower rating is uh, as it is for a particular reason, and that is because of the transport connections to the building. Um, I'm going to bring Graham in uh, as well, and just remind people I'm I'm, gonna, I'm happy to let this meeting run till nine, but not much later than that. Graham, thank you, Sachin. I liked your last comment. I know it's going to be a very long day, <laughs> and online meetings are quite challenging. But with car parking, it is the option that came up actually is we only have the six spaces and make it a car-free design. So that would cost us what 17 whatever it is in the book i can't remember but the four million pounds is you're talking about hundred thousand pound plus um for each car parking space here as it is for the 40 car parking spaces so you know it it's and if you look at all the p-tail rating in wheelstone and the number of car parking spaces made available to the civic center sites it's actually in the excellent category for um, accessibility under the design standards that um, I know you work in this area, so you will be aware of this, Stephen, um, that the government has set out that it's um, because they're saying it should be even worse than that. So we should be down to, I think it was um, down to about 30, which we could put us in a good level. So we've actually got 16 more than um, you know the government guidance sets, but it's also making a presumption that everyone drives to the civic centre when they don't. I, I think yeah, if I make about, I, I think you mean I think you mean the London plan, not the government. But um, in terms of, I mean, so when we're talking about the uh, PTAL ratings and we're talking about the the transport connections, you know, it is it is it is near a mainline station. So people that are coming in and out of of London and in and out of other places in London are going to get there quite easily. When you're talking about people that are coming from elsewhere in Harrow. Um, you know, and this is where we talk about the specific specificity of, of, of Harrow. Um, that it's it's not so easy to get around the borough, Parti particularly you know when you know at the times that our council meetings might finish at nine, ten, sometimes eleven o'clock. You know, later <laughs> at night. Um, and I know that 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 uh, that Councillor Lamond has, has has raised issues about safety, particularly of our female councillors. Um, and officers leaving that late at night, not having a car to go into and walking around the place. Um, so you know, it, it, I, I don't get a sense that we're really gripping this issue. We're just sort of, we're, 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 we're talking in in general terms about uh, where you know what's desirable and, and what's not, but we're not really gripping the issue of of how the very practical issue of how people are going to get there and get home again. Um, and that's what I don't. That's what I. That's what I'm not getting. And and I think I think Stephen, not not to cut you off, but the, the, your your point has been made, and we've we've done this at both the informal sessions, and I think you've got the answer. You've got the answer that you're going to get. You're not going to get much more than that. I didn't get an answer, but well, I got I got a statement. You you got you got what you're going to get. So I'm I'm going to move us on. Um, James has had his hand up for for a while, so I want to bring uh, James in now. So James. Oh yeah. Um, I hope I don't mind just ask two questions. Is that OK? Yeah. Um, first one, quick one, just um, on the commercial spaces. So on the ground floor, um, what what are we looking at in terms of commercial space to be used? Um, what can we use it for, like cafes or whatever? Um, what's what's the uh, what's what's the potential down there? 
And the second question I had on the was on car parts. Uh, considering we're going to move to 50% um, top max working from um, from the Civic Centre or Ford Drive, um, wouldn't it be fair to say there is less of a need for the amount of car park spacing that we had prior? And also, from just um, anecdotal evidence, when I went to full council meetings, very few people drove in and I, I could barely see 40 spaces used even at night. So, you know, on that basis, do you really expect it? And also, I think we're also going to have video conferencing in the future and et cetera. So there's lots of changes occurring. So isn't there a shift away from driving? Wouldn't be that fair to say? Okay, Julian. So, uh, Chair, in terms of the, the spaces, um, uh, yes, both at the depot and at the HNC, uh, which is I'm assuming is where, where you're meaning, uh, there is cafe space. Uh, I mean, it's a matter for the council whether it chooses to uh, um, uh, to, to commercialise those or use them through its own uh, catering organisations or, or what have you. But yes, there's ca cafe space in both. Um, th at the depot itself, there's also commercial space for uh, car, MOT, etc. Um, when we do the business plan for the final stage, we can talk about commercial space in the other developments. But yes, that's the that's the basic position. Um, certainly not going to comment on um, uh, how your meetings take up, but what I can do is agree with the uh, councillor that broadly that is right. There is less demand certainly for staff, um, and in terms of staff, uh, the numbers of car parking spaces crudely as i said but crudely do equate to the number of people who will be uh, in a building at a particular point in time that is a rough calculation but broadly uh, staff wise that's catered for that is a different thing from how it works at the meetings uh, i accept uh, thank you very much for that that's good to know thank you uh, jean and then i'll bring candy in um I have to say this again because clearly the previous meetings were informal meetings and this is a formal ONS meeting. But I raised it very clearly. Steve's alluded to it now. I was very clear in what I said. It was, wasn't to do with numbers. And I think James is unaware of all these part of the conversations. And it was, we were reminded by the Sarah Everard case that no one is safe, especially at night. And female staff, female councillors plus residents who come in the evenings they will come for all sorts of things not just council meetings they might come for uh, reviews and scrutiny reviews etc they are not secure we are not responding to that and i have asked and asked and asked to have this be looked at in terms of safeguarding and all i get is the same iteration oh, we've been up and down the high street sorry julian it's not good enough you know, it really isn't good enough to, we're not looking after the staff the way we should. Which I know Charlie laughingly said, well, we should meet in the daytime, but let's be honest, in the daytime, you're not necessarily secure, but the nighttime uh, meetings, uh, and we are obliged by law to meet physically. If we we're meeting like this forever in a day, wouldn't be a problem, would it? But it's not. And I still have not, after all this, had any feeling that what we've been talking about in terms of safeguarding has been acknowledged and looked into and possible solutions. The only one who mentioned anything was Bahija from Waits and Bahija really spoke about how you sort out the surrounding area etc and I quite understand that but that doesn't account for the Sarah Everard situation and no one feels safe but particularly we won't feel safe, women won't feel safe and it's nothing to do with being in Wildstone I can assure you it's to do with the way society is now and late night meetings. I want to be able to drive my car there and park there. And I'm not I'm not the only one. I know colleagues do. And the second point is I don't think council members were surveyed ever on parking requirements for the Civic Centre. I don't believe they were. Julian may be able to correct me, but I, there's on two levels I feel uh, very disappointed in not getting the sort of responses that we need. Consultation with members, all members, and safeguarding issues following Sarah Everard. Thank you. Okay, uh, Julian. So, um, 
I can't uh, comment on the uh, previous consultation that was uh, before my time, probably not very long before my time, but, uh, but it was. Um, I certainly would hope that we haven't given the impression that the concerns uh, were not recognised. I believe that um, um, officers with the uh, ability to do so have committed to uh, carrying out a further review of safety and uh, taking that forward. Um, uh, we can, uh, if, if members are happy, we can include a line to that uh, in the in the cabinet report. Um, uh, but um, I guess in uh, in defence of the uh, of the report and the, uh, I think it's a bit more than been up and down the high street. I think, frankly, there are limitations in an urban area. Uh, there, the, the simple uh, uh, fact is that there isn't the opportunity to do that. Leave aside the planning policy issues. Uh, so um, uh, certainly the commitment is there to public safety. Of course it is, uh, but actually both the physical and policy constraints. Uh, make provision of additional car parking beyond what is in the report extremely difficult. Well, then we should look at it differently when you can't answer a question that I've just asked. Not you personally, but us as an organisation, we should look at what we're doing and make sure that people are safeguarded in that way. I don't know, Charlie may have something to say. Yes, Charlie. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to reiterate uh, Julian's remarks, the Council takes it very well. Officers and of course members uh, take it very seriously. Uh, Councillor, um, I think we mentioned before, but I reiterate now there is to be, and it's not just because of this particular matter, a review of safety and especially mm. for women uh, walking um, late at night. Of course, the answer, as we have spoken before, for officers working late at night that has always been in place but we're enforce it even more is taxis yeah with a reliable known company to take them home and we've mentioned that previously didn't happen when we were in the civic all the time so that mm. is one but that is just but one answer um mm. since my name was taken um regarding the daytime working of certain meetings i think that should be on as part of an option even if members wish to dismiss it because oh, it is Sorry, essential. Sorry. No, it won't work. Sorry, <laughs> can, can we let Charlie finish, please? It shows it doesn't work. I'm sorry. Stephen, Stephen, that. Charlie, we've asked Charlie a question. At least let's give him the the, the respect of answering it. I, I think it should be looked at as an option. I'm sure it will be rejected, but it should be something. But there are other things that we can do, and we've started to look at that. But we will be doing a review of that, as we did on um, load worker. Um, review yeah. um, just a short while ago as well. And councillor, as we have spoken before, we'd be delighted to have your views into that view as well. Review as well. <laughs> so, which review would that be? Of of uh, late night working, especially for women having to uh, walk home um, in un potentially unsafe areas, or mm. considering themselves to be unsafe because of the area that they're having to walk home in, um, and not just for the meetings that we're talking about, because there are other Times yeah. that may well happen for both officers and for members. Thank you, Charlie. I'll, uh, yes, I happily join you on that. Gra Graham, did you want to come in? But I will, if you can be shorter than thirty seconds, I'll be I'd appreciate it. You know, people's safety is always important, and it's not just the council; it's across the borough. And so we're working quite hard with the police, and that's probably why we're the safest borough in, in London. But there's also the improvements around Wildstone. I know people have been there recently, but there is quite significant improvements around the infrastructure of Wildstone that not opens it up and makes it safer. And the police have said it's designed out crime and some of the um, trouble that used to be there a year ago is no longer there because they haven't, they haven't got that sort of hidden corners. So the mm. bus stops have been moved, the cycling has been moved, I know. the road structure has changed. Yeah, so it has made it a lot safer for people to move around. OK, I've got two two people that want to come in, Canty and Chris. Uh, just remind you of the time and I, I, if you can, if you've got your final questions of less than a minute, that would be great. Canty. Canty, you're on mute. Quick one, Sachi. Um, so Dawn, um, in terms of uh, just coming back to quickly to this strategy of refurbishing the depot, you, we are drawing 7.6 ton or well, close to 8 million from the uh, uh, you know money earmarked some in the results for the poets corner. So then what happens in the future? Because we're just taking from here to there. So doesn't that create a shortfall? No, 
what we've got is we're not taking the money from reserves, we take, we've got the money provided in the capital programme. So um, several years ago, we put some of money into the capital programme for regeneration. And so we are moving that capital within the cup. So we're moving that budget within the capital programme. This is one off expenditure. Um, and so therefore you using this money, it's there for regeneration. We're going to apply it to the depot. So it doesn't cause any shortfall going forward in, in terms of our projections and the business plan. Um, no, what, what we're saying is that in terms of the. That that is for the depot. And the depot at the work, the fit out, etc. of the depot has to be contained within that budget. It's a one off piece of work. The work needs to be contained within that budget. With regard to the with regard to the um, with regard to the HSDP in terms of the capital cash flows that are shown in the appendices, what we have to what we are saying is that that will be managed within the cost neutral model so that any borrowing that we take um, on, if we have to take borrowing on to fund that, will be funded by the um, interest returns that come into the hit that come back from the HSDP. Great. Uh, all right, thank you. Thanks. And finally, Chris. Thank you, Chair. It's just to back up Jeannie. My daughter works in the health system, as most of you know. Now they put on taxis for all late night staff working, especially in the short nights. Um, I just ask of Charlie, that we have got to have this whole system set up before we move. It's no good talking about it, talking about it and get there. It needs to be set up before we move, because what I'd hate to see on a dark winter's night is someone injured because. Oh, oh. Oh, that's a good one, whatever's going on. So that, that wasn't that wasn't me shutting you up. No, Charlie didn't like my question. <laughs> So, Councillor, the, the ability for staff to take taxis late at night is already in being. Uh, I heard that. What I'm actually saying is we've got a lot of people who come into that civic centre late at night. They have got to be given that same protection as our staff. I think, I think uh, the point, I'm not what, sure what the question is. What I'm just saying is before we move into the civic centre, we've already protected our staff. We need to protect non-members of staff, e.g. a councillor or people who are coming into late night meetings that they have an ability to be transported home if they have had come in on public transport, they've got to be taken home because I don't think it's still safe. So I'm just saying it needs to be looked at before we move, not just staff, but members of the public. We're there Absolutely. to serve them, we're there to protect them. Absolutely, before we move to the new civic, yes, most definitely so, and hopefully a long time before that. Well, I hope so, even better. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to um, just in terms of the part two, the only few areas we want to go into part two, I think we can be dealt with by email um, or through the informal process. So I'm not I'm not intending uh, to go into part two because of the time, but please, please make sure you do. Uh, those points can be emailed to us. Um, and finally, I just want to say I, we came to a very, very important point right at the end. So I, I, I don't want people to think that I was rushing closing the meeting on, on, on the the issue of safety uh, because it's not important. It's absolutely important. It just unfortunately in terms of the timing, it came it came on the agenda late on. I think it, when it was being discussed, I could see nods from pretty much all the committee members who had their their cameras on. So. Um, absolutely, in the minutes of this meeting that will go to cabinet, I think it'll be very clear uh, that the committee's view that it, it needs to be taken seriously and we need, uh, we've got time. We, 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 we're, the, as Charlie's pointed out, it's probably five years before um, we're, we're moving in. We've got time, but we do we do need this to uh, to be highlighted and monitored. And I've already given a commitment in my role as chair of the scrutiny function that through uh, the leads meetings through our our leadership group and through this committee, uh, we will continue to keep pressure and keep that um, scrutiny going to ensure that we do it. because for me the question is ensuring people are safe generally, not just uh, people using the site. You know, it shouldn't be the case that you need to have to um, get attacked. So we should be looking at, at the area as a whole and we'll, we'll certainly commit to do that. Um, on that note, um, we have a, a, a recommendation uh, of this. This is going to cabinet and uh, cabinet have a number of recommendations which are on page four of our report. 
and our, our recommendation is that we consider what make recommendations. I suspect I, su I suggest rather than making recommendations. There's there'll be a um, a substantial minute of uh, this report. The portfolio holder and leader of the council has been on the call uh, throughout uh, and has listened to the comments. And I think he'll he'll take those comments back to cabinet. Uh, the minutes will as well, and that we just uh, confirmed that we've considered the report and we um, send our minutes on to cabinet if that is agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Agreed on the understanding that we're not giving consent. And, and, and that, that, yeah, that we're not necessarily saying that we agree or that we disagree. This is what we've noted. And that point is, is, is noted and Graham's, Graham's heard that point and we haven't we haven't taken a vote, so we can't actually agree anything in that sense because the committee. Well, I'm not going to push the committee to a vote on that. Um, so on that note, um, can I thank uh, members of the committee? Can I thank uh, officers? Can I thank all our representatives from uh, Waits? Can I thank Graham uh, representing the administration for being through the whole whole meeting? It has been a long meeting. <coughs> Um, can I uh, remind members of the committee that we have an informal session of contract close uh, coming up and uh, the date excuse, it leaves me at the moment, but it is in your diaries and then a final session in July. Um, sorry, in uh, at the end of June before contract close goes to July meeting. So those are all coming up. We will get by email responses that would have otherwise been in part two. Um, and on that note, uh, thank you all. Uh, good night. Good night. Stay safe. Thank you, sir.